Hey, it's five o'clock. I'd like to call the meeting of the meeting of the support the water. Okay, it is Monday, June tenth at five o'clock. I'd like to call the village trustees to order for this joint meeting. Are there any additions or deletions from the agenda? Uh, no, but I'd like to change the presentation to the personal policy first, followed by my presentation, if that's okay. So, okay, so under presentation, just personnel and then. Yeah, the personnel policy way still like me and then. Okay. Okay, just trustees, any other additions or deletions? Moving on, uh, citizens' comments. Are there any citizen comments in the room or on Zoom? We've got all 10 of us in one place. This is your opportunity. <laughs> okay. Then let's move on to discussion, uh, IT update. Okay. Yeah, so um, as both boards know, last year we contracted with uh, the town of Hanover, New Hampshire. Uh, to provide IT services for the municipality. Uh, we're going on to year two, July 1. Um, we tried to set this up probably last September, and time has never worked out on either one of our parts. Um, so we have Alex, the town manager of Hanover, here today to kind of give us a quick presentation and answer any questions. Uh, but I'll just say on my end, it has been a great help to have them involved with us. Um, as the board's aware in the past, we just had a consultant. Uh, which caused a few issues. One, we never could budget for it because we never knew how much it was going to cost because it was an hourly rate each time we called them. Uh, second, there was um, a concern about using them because we didn't want to charge the money. So department heads would spend their own time trying to fix their laptop, trying to fix an email issue, uh, potentially getting viruses and all that fun stuff. Uh, and third, there was a lack of oversight and planning because it was kind of ad hoc who would call him, who was in charge of him. Um, so despite him doing good work, I thought it was nice to have kind of more reliable service set up. Uh, what we budget for so it's a set cost, so it doesn't cost us any extra money if we call them one time a day or 10 times a day. Um, there have been two uh, gentlemen that have been very helpful with us. Um, they set up a uh, workflow, so we have issues. We can actually just go online, submit a ticket. And then they can work. Um, they've come out here numerous times. Anytime we need to, they help with EEI and, and the work there. Uh, they're helping us prep for a new employee. Uh, so I found it very helpful, very useful. Uh, makes things for us a little bit easier throughout it. So I've been very happy uh, with that. I'll turn it over to Alex. Sure. Yeah, it'd be great. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. I know we wanted to get together, as Eric mentioned a little while ago. I just brought a couple like stats that my folks from the IT department gave me that I can just read out if it's helpful. And then I'm happy to share a little bit about um, um, anything else that you'd like to ask about or anything else that I can uh, kind of help inform. Um, so a couple of the kind of like uh, work activities from the last year, and I'll just say too, from my perspective as a town manager, but also from my IT director and our IT specialist perspective, They've really enjoyed coming out here. Um, obviously, um, you know, it's always like kind of interesting for folks that find it interesting, like getting into a new organization, figuring out what the issues are, trying to help people kind of get onboarded and all that. Um, and so they have enjoyed that and have appreciated working with all the staff that they have worked with. Um, so we brought 45 uh, desktops and laptops um, sort of into a more managed ecosystem. I mean, that includes also getting antivirus installed on all of those computers. Um, and setting up software so that they can actually remote in and troubleshoot certain issues remotely so they don't have to come out here. Um, Hanover does provide, um, we have a dispatch center, a regional dispatch center that's run through our police department. Um, we provide 911 uh, dispatching and um, an after hour dispatching um, for 22 towns in New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, and so this was sort of a um, kind of a natural follow on um, from our perspective because we have a lot of sort of shared regional infrastructure in place um, already. So we brought 45 computers into that kind of ecosystem. Um, we got, um, I know we got a new laptop uh, for Eric, a new desktop for the fire chief, a new computer set up in the dispatch center um, as well. We got three new tough books set up in different police cruisers. Um, we got five that were set up in a, as part of an energy efficiency program that I'm not super familiar with, but I'm sure Eric is. Um, and I know we set up some uh, copiers and printers for the listers and for planning as well. Um, and we processed a couple dozen like help desk tickets and requests for service, troubleshooting issues, um, things like that. 
And so I think part of, you know, is sort of responding to questions, concerns, troubleshooting, but part of it is also, um, you know, I've worked in a couple different towns. Um, it is helpful coming off of as a sort of situation um, that you all were here uh, with your IT before, having a fresh set of eyes come in and kind of like give you a little bit of a sense of where things stand. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, obviously it wasn't as big of an issue, but like pretty much everything we do today runs through some sort of piece of hardware or software. Um, and so if those things go down, it can obviously really complicate operations. And there's obviously, of course, liability and things associated with, um, you know, hacking and stuff like that as well, which happens more than um, I think any of us would like to think, including to municipal governments and to police departments. Um, so I know uh, Corey Stevens and Michael um, are, are two IT folks have just been really um, happy with everything. Um, you know, like Eric mentioned, the way that we set up the contract, and I'm, I'm sure you shared, I'm sure you all reviewed the RFP and the response that we provided when you all selected us about a year ago. Um, but that unlimited help desk piece was actually really important. Um, and, you know, it took, we had to kind of make sure all the scheduling worked on our end, but it's really important that staff don't think, well, I have a computer problem, but is this going to cost, you know, another $50 if I call somebody? Like, you don't want staff, you know, if they, if they think there's a phishing issue or a virus, like, you want someone immediately calling and trying to figure out, you know, help we can figure out whatever the issue is. So hopefully we've created that environment. Um, you know, we are, uh, you know, we're interested in renewing, um, you know, for additional years. Um, and if there's feedback that I can take back to our IT staff, uh, you know, things that we could do, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, but happy to speak to anything. To help that One thing I'll just add too is uh, we're starting to work with them on kind of revamping this room. And what we can do meaning wise and make it more efficient more better a better so that's kind of a long-term goal we have with them as well hmm. and if it's um we, so we haven't talked about that yet eric but um you know we have two uh zoom rooms that we set up in our library and that our it did and they are like super is cameras and microphones and speakers in the ceiling and walls and i'm sure some of you have seen that in some places and um so it allows our library to do like really really um uh like well integrated public meetings and so Stuff like that is also stuff we're happy to help with. How much has the help desk been used? Uh, pretty significantly, I've used it a lot. Um, I had to be trained on it first. I kept on calling them and emailing them, and they had to redirect me to the help desk. Uh, but I use it significantly, and other employees use it as well. Uh, we've got a number of how many times we've submitted tickets if you'd like. We've got about two dozen, um, I think, tickets, but many more emails and phone calls, which I make the same mistake with my IT department, which is not always putting the ticket in correctly and just saying, hey, can you fix this thing? And then then they put the ticket in. So it doesn't track all of that. It's just the it's just the initial tickets that went in. So 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 I would guess probably around maybe, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 like troubleshooting things, which if you're on like an on demand or, or pay per time, you know, you're probably paying more for the service just for the ticketing, you know, not to mention all the other sort of um proactive stuff getting the computer set up but we like we like um ticket usage because it means that people are reaching out with questions and uh, and again that's the biggest thing you know we started doing a phishing uh training program with all of our users um where um it's through our outlook uh you know system and it sends people like fake phishing messages and if you click on one then you kind of get moved into this other pathway where you kind of have you have to do a training um, and I'll say it is, it is shocking. The failure rate on the first one, it was like half of the organization clicked on the phishing email. And now when they send out like the fake ones, you get, you know, we have about, um, probably on our email ecosystem, there's probably about 160 or, or so people on there, um, like in our outlook and you might get a couple people each time. So it had a huge difference. And, you know, like if you ask any IT person, like what's the weakest point of your network, the user. And so, um, you know, getting all that kind of worked up and, you know, we can always like, if there are specific programs like the Zoom stuff or a phishing tree, like we're always happy to sort of design some stuff around like a specific program too. Great, thank you. Coming in last year, what was, what was your biggest challenge coming in here? What was it you looked and you were like, oh dear God, the first thing you have to do is X. Um, so I will say I have a technology background, though I'm not, you know, a full like IT person. Um, so from my perspective, and in my conversations with the IT folks, a couple things, 
I think the biggest part is not having a managed ecosystem. And what I mean by that is, you know, every computer, you know, in a database, we know when the last software update was applied. We know when the computer was purchased. We know when it's going to be, um, when it needs to be replaced. Like having all of that really well mapped out is really important because it also, obviously I do a lot of the budget stuff as well. And it's nice to have the sort of, whether you purchase through operating or capital to be able to know, okay, we've got X many desktops. They last, you know, however many years now, three or four years. So you can plan things out a little bit more. Um, so it can help a little bit in that regard. But I think that was one of the bigger issues was just that there wasn't really a centralized kind of um, database of kind of where everything stood. And then I know, I believe, and Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe a, most of your services are in the cloud. Like there's not a ton of stuff on hardware in the building, which is in many ways a good thing because then you don't have to worry about backing things up as much. But I think the antivirus, which I think is now on all of the Woodstock computers, that was another thing, having that one layer. So they use Bitdefender, um, and uh, that can sometimes, you know, grab you if you hit a link that's, a, you know, going to a bad site or something as well. Um, so I think that was a big one. Um, the, la the database kind of not having everything up to date. And then I think it's people, um, you know, and I don't have the day-to-day -day experience of it, but people running into an issue and not really being able to get a solution. You know, so that you might have someone like who has a problem. Sure, we all do this sometimes, but you just sort of like, all right, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll do that later. And then you never really do it, but it, you know, it messes up your work day. And you've got staff that your taxpayers are paying, you know, and we want people to work efficiently. And if someone's stuck on some issue, you know, um, uh, so that they can now, you know, put that help desk in. And hopefully we've been responsive to all of those things. Um, you know, they can do a lot of that remotely and then come out every once in a while. But so I, I would say those were probably the biggest the biggest issues, the sort of replacement plan, um, you know, having either whether the backup or security in place. And then I think as you do more stuff, if you're doing more Zoom room type things, um, you know, we can also talk more about, um, you know, firewall, you know, things that provide additional security, you know, to the network. But because so much stuff here is in the cloud, um, the risk there is a, a little bit lower. Whereas some towns that I've worked in, um, try not to like tell stories here, um, but I know you've got a long agenda, but one of the towns I was in, you know, they, we had, it was all servers in house and they were in a closet and the cooling for the closet was a giant, um, box fan that was just plugged into an outlet. So if the power went out, the fan went out, which like, I might question how well that fan was working anyway, you know, on a good day. Um, and I remember seeing that and just, and just, and uh, I was like, okay, well we have to like fix this like today. Like this is really, and that was like our email server, our website, all of that was hosted in house. So that was not good. Um, but, but you all don't have that issue. So that's nice. And then I just have one more question. Sure. Um, so it seems like you've got the ecosystem all set up for the town. So there are those of us that are not in town employees, but certainly are doing town work, town business, um, a lot of times from our Gmail or whatever. Right. Have you run into anything in Hanover or anybody else that you've worked with that are like best practices or things that we should be looking out for because we could contaminate the other emails or whatever? Is that, are there things that we should be thinking about or trainings that we should be taking? So that's a great question. And I'll give a little caveat, which is, you know, New Hampshire. I mean, I, they're, they're similar in many ways, but a little different, but I think probably pretty similar. I think there's a policy decision that you all can make with Eric as far as who you want to extend and bring into the ecosystem, you know, I would certainly say it's, it's, it starts costing money. I mean, we're going through this right now with all of our boards and committees, which is, um, it's different than, um, oh, I knew it. I'm now forgetting the, the law in Ver our, our equivalent for public records in Vermont. Um, but, um, you know, if you put every board member and every committee member, I mean, you'd be spending like thousands and thousands of dollars a month just on email. So, so we're, do, you know, we're probably looking at something we haven't, we haven't worked it all out yet, but for example, where, each committee, so you know, all of our different advisory committees and boards might have one town email address that the co-chairs or chairs have access to. And then if people want to copy that email address, that then puts it into our email ecosystem. So then if we need to do a, a records request, we can go search for it rather than extending, you know, 12 email addresses to everybody on the 15 different like committees. You know, I think that that's something we could certainly, if you all wanted to move in. Um, into that ecosystem, we could certainly help with that, like as far as setting up email addresses for all the board members. Um, and from a phishing and security standpoint, it is a good idea, um, even beyond the record stuff, because one of the sort of phishing attacks is if you have a personal email, 
right? The town has no way to control, you know, your password could be password. Um, hopefully nobody's is, but, um, uh, you know, it could be that, and, yeah, right. Whoops. Sorry. Um, and, um, and that means that if your email and I've seen this happen in other, uh, it has not happened in Hanover, but it has happened in other towns I've worked in where someone's personal email address gets hacked and then it gets into your, basically your address book and sends out stuff to everybody. So then what happens is employees or somebody in the town environment is getting an email with your name on it and saying, Oh, I need to, and it's usually like, uh, you know, I need you to look at this budget, you know, it's something that sounds like urgent or something. And then people, you know, don't even think they don't even think to look at the email address and see that it's a Gmail. But if, but if you're using personal email, basically it just increases the risk because right now, you know, I mean, we, our select board was in personal emails up until a year ago, we moved everybody into the, our outlook system, you know, which helps with calendars and documents stuff too. But now if someone gets an email from like a board member or an official and it's from a personal account, and people do it. Now. It's actually really nice. I mean, people will, you know, bring their phone over and say, does this look legit? And I'm like, it does not. Um, and so it's really nice to have that like extra layer. And we could definitely help give some advice on that. You know, we could cost things out, um, you know, give you ideas. Um, if you say, okay, here's a plan. And you say that's too expensive. You know, we could think of alternatives, for example. Thank you. So we're happy to do that. Yeah. Other questions? Comment? I'm just curious from um, like, obviously there's like the device management and the ecosystem. Are there also like business application recommendations mm. in terms of efficiency that you would recommend or like have your eye on for us? Obviously knowing that New Hampshire is different from Vermont and maybe our needs are different, but wondering if seeing as you are also in municipal government, there are tools we don't know about that we could use for some of our departments or systems. Mm. You know? Currently. We could totally um, have that conversation. I think there are, I think I would say um, there are tools and applications, especially in Outlook that are really useful. I think there are some that are less useful. And I would say, uh, and it's easy to go down a road where you like spend all your time, especially it sounds like maybe a couple of you work in some or with some tech related stuff like, you know, like Microsoft has like four different project management tools. You know, there's like Microsoft Task, Microsoft Planner, Microsoft Projects. And they're all different and they're all so so I, you know one of the things that we could certainly do is is you know work with eric to identify like if there are efficiency improvements there and say okay here are the tools that are out there we could then sort of because we do a lot of stuff in our outlook ecosystem we could say here's the products that microsoft offers here are alternatives you know one of the ones that are you know starting to be talked about more are the you know generative ai like chat gpt related things that we're just starting to like use a little bit um, and we're going to put a policy in place that limits that usage to kind of certain things and requires, like, if you're creating original content, um, but using ChatGPT that, the, you know, that the employee discloses that if they're, you know, so, I mean, I don't know how teachers and students are dealing with this today, uh, like in K through 12, but um, so there are some things like that, but also, you know, like, for example, ChatGPT, extremely useful. Uh, you know, I would say I'm an okay person with Microsoft Excel, but some of the really complex stuff, like I just don't know how to do. And I have saw, I've like done really complicated things with Excel by troubleshooting what I'm trying to work on in chat GPT. So they're not producing any content, but it's basically a better version than Microsoft's help system, which I find very confused, sometimes more confusing. So I was trying to run some analyses for an HR project for our select board and I couldn't figure out how to do the formulas and I go into chat. He's like, do I do this? And it gave me three options and I tried one of them and didn't do it quite right. I put it back in and it corrected the formula and then I put it back in and it all worked. So things like that are really nice because, um, uh, you know, again, if someone's banging their head against the wall trying to figure something out, you know, or they're going to another employee and, and they're spending 30 minutes trying to figure something out and you can just do it in two minutes online. I mean, that could be yeah. a nice thing. And, and uh, so anyway, there's things like that that we could definitely do. Um, you know, I would certainly um, recommend just off the cuff, you know, obviously beyond the email, just the document collaboration and the calendars and people really using calendars well, you know, putting in, you, if you use the appointment feature where you can set blocks of time, which sometimes some staff know about, some don't. So you can say, okay, I'm available for meetings for these four hours and then people can just go book time on your calendar directly. So there's like all these different things and, you know, we're happy to brainstorm happy to provide any advice, costs, alternative stuff like that.
there's there's some good options there. Thank you. thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the support um, in Hanover and, and doing the shared service with us. I think it's a great thing to do. And, you know, my own personal opinion, and I think Eric and I go to a lot of, you know, municipal management meetings, and the more that we can work together as towns, I think we just get better and better value for the taxpayers. And so, um, big fan of that. So, thanks for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being on our team. Yeah. I'm happy to. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear you're discussing audits next to it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not go to enough public meetings? I know. You know yeah, I, our our select board meetings on Monday night, so I'm in my you know, schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Item on the agenda is a vote on the Vail Field Agreement. Yep. So, um, it's been a long standing agreement uh, verbally, I believe, that the rec center would. Uh, do the maintenance of Vail Field and use it despite it being a village property. Um, on the assumption that uh, in the town budget, money we allocated to the rec center, um, I thought it was important to kind of codify that into an agreement, uh, legal document. Uh, so I worked with Gail to kind of put something together. Um, I know some board members have mentioned some changes, uh, edits, and whatnot that we can get into. Um, but I thought it'd be important for the both boards to review and then and vote to make sure we have it kind of set up the way it should be um, to make sure that beyond this board and beyond me, you know, there are agreements in place that people can uh, revert back to. I have a question. Yep. Uh, under two responsibilities of the town of Woodstock, what does shall provide necessary support to the rec for Vale field management? Is that so that uh, great example is uh, we had DPW out there a few weeks ago to move um, some stuff off the river okay. that they need they need help with. So kind of big projects we go out there and help them with okay. um, the day to day stuff. They take care of it. Okay. Or replacing that bridge. Yes, exactly. Things that they can, they can take care of, they they do things that need uh, larger help. But we're there for it. Yep, uh, Susan. Then yeah, and as I emailed you, I think we just need to be consistent and say WRC instead of RAC. Yeah, I have those on mine that I'll, I'll update afterwards. Yeah. Okay. And Laura, I think you wanted to move the fourth full yeah. pointer under number one to number two, correct? Yeah. It just seemed like um, oh. that maybe the fourth point under one and the third point under two were the, the same. same. Yeah. Um, but I also would like to add a provision for for the rec giving us and or the Woodstock Recreation Center giving us estimates maybe on a regular basis so we can make sure we're like budgeting appropriately. Um, yeah. And I'd also maybe suggest that the second bullet point under one holds authority over decisions related to the utilization utilization and design of the space as long as it's consistent with zoning bylaws or you know yeah. whatever. And they are because they're going through that right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No uh, yeah. So I think to Laura, your, your first point about the budget, uh, the line which we'll be discussing agreed upon each budget cycle. I thought that would be a good way. So when we're doing the next budget, the rec center can come in front of the board and say, here's a cost associated with next year of maintaining real fields. Okay. The boards can then say, that's appropriate. That's a window that's too high, justify it. And that'd be a good chance to yeah. use then. So maybe the fourth point under one should be something like they provide the estimates. Third point remains the same, or like we allocate the we allocate the budgetary resources. Okay. At at the discretion of the select board, or select boards, or however you can do it. Are there any other comments, suggestions on that agreement as a whole? So with our in insurance so i i see that under their responsibilities they have to do the insurance coverage for the sports we have sort of like an overall insurance yeah so a good example is after the floods um their insurance claims came through our insurance not through okay. theirs okay and so the mini right. yeah well the, the major one would cause uh more severe damage yes so so when so when i sign my kid up to to play soccer through the rec and I sit and I sign off on the, the thing that says I'm not going to sue or whatever, whatever they have me sign. My kid breaks my leg. Um, 
does that cover does that say you're not going to sue the the rec center and you're also not going to sue the town or does their liability waiver for sports just cover that i'd have to look at what the liability waiver is but my first assumption probably just covers them i'm guessing because if we have insurance on it and it's well it wasn't the you know people will go after who has who yeah. have the, the bigger pot of money um and so i would just add add something or however you see fit that whenever they are allowing something to happen that the the town gets written into any liability waiver so that we're not held uh for those things i think just a problem I think that we should go over there and take a look around uh, because my son was recently over there and said that there's a lot of posts that are sticking up out of the ground that are really dangerous. But they're four feet high. No, I don't believe that's what it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I think that we should investigate all of us and take a look at it and, and make an assumption before we proceed forward with this to make sure that we are aware of what um, we're up against as far as hazards okay. and maybe eliminating the hazards. Right. I'm There's a few. No, I think we should look into it. Okay. Trustees, you all have anything else on this? Back board. Frank? No. no. So if those changes are made, are you happy sign or do you want to come back in front of the board after those changes are made? I mean, ideally, I'd like to see it all updated. Okay. Of course I would. <laughs> Laura's nodding too. Laura's nodding too. I, I'll host everybody. Everybody can get coffee at my house. I'll bring donuts. <laughs> Emily will almost every field trip. Field trip meeting. We don't cross outside. Anything else about? No, I'll make those changes. Do you know when I just off topic? Do you know when the bridge is going to be ready? Uh, no, it's been postpone us until we get the new director of public works in. Can I bridge the property? I believe so, yes. It is. Uh, next item on our agenda is audit review of the town and the village. So Tyler uh, is on Zoom, who uh, is the auditor again uh, this year. Um, so I don't know if we want to do The village first, half an hour for the village, half an hour for the town. Um, takes that long. Um, Tyler, are you there? I am. How are you guys? Good. Good. Uh, so we'll turn it over to you. All right. Um, well, thanks again for, for having us back. Um, I had to really refresh my memory before this meeting and say, okay, what all happened with this audit? Um, so I guess I'll start with the village because that'll probably be quicker than the towns. Um, and if, if you guys want me to go the other in the other direction, that's fine too. Just go ahead and speak up. Um, so anyway, for the village, um, the, the report format um, that you see this year for FY23 is going to be very similar to 22. Um, I think just overall, and this applies for both the town and the village, um, you know, there was obviously a pretty big shift in in the accounting function between, you know, Zoe to, um, um, you know, to, uh, oh my gosh. Robert. Robert, <laughs> thank you. Wow. He, he is here. You heard that tell. I just didn't we, we have talked. We, we're good. I meant to say Robert. It's been a, been a long day. Um, yes. And, um, you know, just, just, that is a big uh, change, and then obviously uh, the town and village accounting system is not. Um, I mean, as you guys know, you know it's not it's not simple, right? It's not it's not small. Um, there are a lot of accounts. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so all in all, I, I gotta say, uh, Robert's I, I think really done a good job. Um, I think the one thing that you'll see reflective in the town report is. Um, 
just a single audit. And um, that was a whole new ball of wax for the town. Um, I mean, they have been, they have had a single audit in the past, but uh, this was kind of a, you know, an initial year. The last one was several years ago. So it's been a while since it's had single audit stuff that introduced a whole new set of rules and reporting. So some issues came up there, but back for the village, um, the village did not need a single audit. Um, so that was good news. The uh, timing of the audit, um, it started in November. Um, there was a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of help by Cynthia from Nemrick, um, who really helped, uh, you know, pull the trial balance together, pull schedules for the audit together. Obviously Robert was, was involved with that. Um, so, you know, the, the trial balance got, got to us for audit a little later than normal, but all in all, it finished up around the same time it did last year. Um, I'm hopeful that, you know, an audit in the future would go smoother now that Roberts had, you know, one year under his belt of the audit process. And obviously he's gonna have more insight and knowledge on the chart of accounts and the accounting uh, structure in, at the town and village. So I would think the next audit would go a lot smoother. Um, then this one did and a lot, probably more efficient too. Um, but as for the village, there really weren't any new changes to accounting standards that applied to the village. We did have a few proposed audit adjustments, but nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, there's always some activity in the permanent fund that has to get reported in NEMRIC. Um, the inner funds, just the way that town and the village are set up, they're all in one general ledger and not split up between two different ones. So there's some activity that just has to get broken out for reporting. You know, that way you separate the town activity and the village activity um, and record amounts due to and from the village since um, the cash is all pooled in the town's general fund. Um, so that was you know, an audit adjustment there. Um, there was some activity that we uh, proposed for the Veemers pension plan. Uh, just updating that information uh, based off of actuary reports um, and auditor uh, reports from the state. Uh, there were a couple of adjustments with relation to cumulative depreciation and um, uh, related depreciation expense. Uh, that was just based off of the schedules that we got um, from Robert and Cynthia and uh, the accrued compensated absences. That was just uh, a small update there. Uh, to match up with the schedules uh, that we got for the audit. So all in all, the village went pretty smooth. No, um, no findings to report, um, no significant difficulties. So all in all, uh, we say the village audit went pretty smooth. And, um, you know, I'm happy to go into more details with the village if you want, or I can just jump straight to the town. I'm not sure if folks have questions, I'm happy to, happy to dig in or, issues. Jeffrey? Uh, I've got a question. Please. I've, I've got a question in terms of uh, revenue sources mm -hmm. for the village. Um, on all of the different revenue pages, I'm trying to find where the Rockefeller Investment Fund, which comes into the village, uh, uh, a portion of it, um, every year as a, as a revenue source. I don't, I don't know why it doesn't show up under a long list of revenues, although it's kind of hidden somewhere else. But are you familiar with the, what I'm talking about? It's usually about ten thousand five hundred dollars. Um, yes. Um, it is going to be if you look on page thirty-eight. Um, you will see the um, actually it'll, uh, it'll be second column. To the um, so from the far right second column back, uh, it's called endowment fund. There's a there's a separate uh, col column for it. That's page on on page 38. Um, what you'll see there is the change in that in the villages portion of the you know, the Rockefeller money, and then you'll see a little farther down in that column uh, the transfer out eleven thousand dollars. Right. Um, going into the village. Not listed anywhere as income on the revenue pages. So on page 38, you'll see the total column on the far right. Um, and that is gonna include all these columns, you know, prior to that, the endowment fund, the value of that Rockefeller money. Uh, so that, that total column 
you will then see in the in the fund statements. Um, so that's that's the information that you would see. This page here, page 38, breaks it out so you can kind of see, okay, what all is that made up of? Yeah, I see it on that page. Thank you. I just don't see it in the revenue page. Look. Yeah, so then if you looked at page, um, just flip over to it. If you look over to page 16, you would see um, the, the permanent fund, if you will. So that column is going to match the total column of that schedule that we were just looking at on page 38. Oh, I see. Interfund transfers in? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, no, no, I was just... Um, so it's oh, not just the yeah. $19,000? Correct. Yeah, it would be in there, right? So then you'll see in that section how they all kind of balance out. Um, you know, just basically that $19,000 then going, then if you look at the general fund column, you'll see the 19000 transfer in, you know, match, you know, netting it out. All right. Thank you. Trustees, any other questions? Frank, do you have any questions? Um, Tyler, sometimes um, when we've done these audits at the end, we've had recommendations for improvement for the next year. Did you have any for the village? Um, I think just, you know, with the staff, you know, with Robert now on board, um, you know, at the moment, I don't have anything. Um, I think, you know, maybe in a next year audit, there might be something, something might come up. But honestly, um, from what I've seen so far, I, I think things are looking good. Um, I do have to comment, you know, Robert, he does seem to have a really good accounting foundation under his belt, which is really good. And something is kind of critical for down here. Um, so I, I, at this point, no, I don't have anything to, to recommend. Um, good, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Town people. Do you want to move on to the town audits? Sure. Yeah, let me start. Um, you know, town reports are going to look very similar to the villages. Um, I'll start with this three page governance letter. It kind of gives the highlights of everything. Um, the timing of the town audit was, was very similar to the villages. Um, actually, the towns got done a little sooner than the villages, really because there was um, a reporting deadline with the federal audit clearinghouse since the town needed a single audit. So this audit was done right on April 1st, the deadline uh, for that submission to the federal audit clearinghouse. So that was good. So everything got submitted on time. Um, nothing was late there. Um, no new accounting standards that really hit the town in, in a significant way. Um, there were some audit adjustments. There are more audit adjustments than in the village, but there's also a lot more activity going on in the town than the village. Um, and in terms of what all we propose adjustments on, uh, it's really pretty similar to years past. Um, permanent fund activity, uh, just, just getting that activity matched up in NEMRIC with the supporting schedules that the trustee maintains. Um, Interfunds and transfers between the town and the village. You know, it's just it's all in one general ledger. Some some breakout has to happen for the, for the statements and the and all that. Um, the sewer fund. There was some asset depreciation activity that we adjusted there, and um, activity relating to the Vemer uh, pension plan. Uh, just you know, adjusting to actuary reports and uh, a few other reports from the state that we get. That pretty much is a significant, uh, those, I mean, those were the significant adjustments in the town. Um, we did adjust some of the ambulance activity, but that wasn't anything crazy. The, the ambulance activity is tracked in a separate system from NEMRIC. So sometimes, uh, normally, historically, the two systems do not talk to each other. Um, so some adjustments have to get proposed normally to just match the two systems up. So that's really why that's happening. And um, you will see that the town needed a single audit. 
for fiscal year 23, which is um, definitely a change from years past. I think the last single audit was, I want to say fiscal year 17, and that might not be correct, but it was a while ago, either way. So this was kind of a new thing. Um, then of course, Robert um, being new, so he had to go through the single audit. Um, so that was a whole nother, whole nother curveball. So we did have some, some findings in the town. Um, that you'll see here on the last page of this governance letter just kind of summarized. Um, I'll flip over to the actual findings that you'll find starting on pages. Uh, so pages 74, 75, and 76. And I'll just mention the first one. Um, I mean, it's not a huge issue, but all the same, it was late. Um, there's a report that the town needs to file with the Vermont Department of Finance and Management uh, within 45 days after the town's year end. Um, this report was filed 52 days after the town's year end. So it was late, not by a lot, but it was late. So either way, um, that, was, that was one instance of non-compliance that we noted. That was this finding number 2023-001 that starts on page 74. And then um, relating to the single audit, we had two findings there. I'll start with the first one, this 2023-002. Um, the major program for the town single audit was this clean water state revolving fund relating to the sewer uh, project that's going on there at the town. Um, and basically the issue here was that the, the schedule of federal expenditure, the, sch the schedule of expenditures of federal awards that we got you know, to audit, um, it included amounts that were not federal. Um, so that was pretty much the issue there. Um, the uniform guidance is pretty clear that you've got a total, the federal awards expended, you don't, I mean, if you're gonna include state amounts or non-federal amounts, they need to be clearly separated. And in this case, they were not, they were just clumped in with the program uh, expenditure amount. So that was what this first finding, or this, this finding 2023-002 was, was hitting on. And then um, kind of had a different issue with the finding in 2023-03. Uh, there were two grants that, and, and they were federal expenditures. Um, these grants were federal in nature. And uh, these two grants simply weren't on the schedule that we got for audit. So that was just, these amounts were just excluded and they should have been included. Um, so that was the issue with, with this one. Um, these, these grants were, were not uh, major programs for the single audit. Uh, so that's why they're just separated out <clears throat> just for reporting to the federal audit clearinghouse. Um, you kind of want to separate activity relating to the major program that was audited versus the uh, non-major programs. So that pretty much summarizes um, the towns. Um, trying to think of anything else that I wanted to highlight. There were, when you're looking at the government-wide statements, there were um, two restatements, nothing major. It related to accrued interest on the long-term debt. Um, last year's town report, for some reason, didn't have it in. So we proposed um, an adjustment there to get that in for the report. Um, so that's what that first in, that first restatement amount was. And then there was another piece of the restatement, uh, which, with, which related to an overstatement of uh, some accounts payable. So nothing nothing crazy, but uh, just worth, worth a highlight. And um, there's a lot more I could talk about, but um, I think I'll open it up for questions. And if folks want me to go into more detail on anything, I'm happy to do that. Um, you used the term single audit, and for those of us not in the accounting field, can you explain why that was required and what it entailed? That's different from our normal audit. Right, right. So, so normally you guys just have a you know kind of a standard, um, you know, audit. Um, you know, prescribed by the GASB. So there, you know, there's there's that audit and then, you know, government auditing standards apply since the town is a government. So you have that. It's um, called like a yellow book report that we then issue um, relating to that. Now, since the town had federal expenditures that were in excess of $750,000, um, that triggers what they call a single audit for the year ended June 30, 2023. So now there's a whole nother audit that's required and it's required by the um, uniform guidance 
it's written into the code of federal regulations. So if you ever wanted to look at it, um, you can just, you know, actually really just Google it, <laughs> just, you know, single audit um, as required by uniform guidance and, and you'll get a hit. And uh, it just kind of lays out all the requirements, you know, and, and it does apply if your uh, expenditure, if your federal expenditures are in excess of $750,000. Uh, so what that meant is we had to get a schedule uh, from Robert, you know, some, somebody from the town listing out those federal awards and um, you know, detailing them by, okay, what federal agency did they come to where they passed through uh, the state or another agency or something like that. So that's the, um, that's the report you see on page, let me just pull it up so you can look at it. Uh, on, page, on page 72, you'll see that report. So basically we got this schedule and then we applied, um, you know, single audit procedures, and that basically involved looking at the different grants listed on it, and then picking what they call a major program, you know, based off of significance, dollar amount normally. Um, and then from there, once we pick this, the, the major program, then we just applied, you know, additional audit procedures uh, to that grant based off of guidance from uh, the Office of Management and Budget and other, um, other sources. In a nutshell, that's that's what it, that's what it is. Um, it's nothing nothing um, nothing bad or anything like that. It's just a requirement if the federal expenditures are over a certain amount. So last year our bill for the town was nine, a little over nineteen thousand, and this year it was thirty. Is that because of the single audit? So the fees on the Let me let me just look up the historical on that. There, I mean, there's definitely going to be an, an additional charge for the single audit because it's a whole other audit that we have to do. Um, so the town, yeah, it looks like in 2022, the fee charge was about 23. 2324 and change. Um, and then this year it went up um, by, I think we basically said the single audit and, and the single audit pricing kind of has a range. I mean, it's kind of based on complexity too. Um, and then obviously if it's a first, what we would consider a first year, I, you know, the past two years weren't audited or the past two years didn't have a single audit. Uh, you know, we factored that into the pricing as well. So the single audit added about seven thousand dollars to that that fee from last year, more or less. And should we expect that next year? I mean, just because this came in a, a, quite a bit over what we budgeted, so it made it made it difficult. Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely, you know, keep keep tabs on the federal expenditures because um, if they do fall below 750, um, you know, you won't need a single audit. I've also heard um, some rumblings. I got to confirm it that the threshold is going to be going up, uh, so that could also positively impact you guys. Um, so I think, um, yeah, just keep just keep tabs on where you think your federal expenditures are going to be because uh, I'm just thinking historically. Uh, the town hasn't needed a single audit every year. Uh, it's kind of been sporadic. I know the last time uh, the town needed it, it was for that Stafford or Stafford Commons uh, housing project. Um, so you know, if if history if history is any indication, uh, the town will need it every single year. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, if 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 the expenditures are over, yeah, definitely anticipate you know that single audit uh, fee having to you know get paid once that audit's done. And just one point of clarification, uh, when yeah. and Robert and Patricia looked into it and we realized that no money had been allocated to the sewer for the audit. So they actually transferred $7,000 today from the town budget over the sewer for the audit. So the, the town now is at 23,000, not 30,000. Are there any questions from the select board or the trustees?
Uh, uh, that's the case. I'll let Tyler go. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Good rest of the meeting. Thank you. Um, next, we're moving into an executive session. So I'll consider a motion to enter executive session under 1 BSA 313 A1A to uh, discuss uh, personnel uh, matters. So Is there a second? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, well, any nays? Sorry. Motion carries. Um, so we will consider a motion to enter executive session under 1 BSA 313 to discuss personnel. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nikki, uh, do a breakout room for Frank, please. Um, you want to see you want to? Well, I'll go maybe the back room quickly. Hey, Robert. 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 No, no, no. That's Leaving without talking. No, I always will always go back there. Okay. Oh, no. Bye. Yes. 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 Yes.
Sorry. Okay, Perry joining us. I thought she was. I think she's in her car. Oh. Right. Where's my? I mean, gotcha. yeah. Okay, so we're out of the executive session. On to presentations. Our first one is the personnel policy presentation. There's a man at the podium. I don't know who he is. Eric Duffy, municipal manager. That guy. Um, so I'm here uh, this evening uh, to talk to the board about updating the personnel policy. Um, we'll get into kind of the ifs and buts uh, in a second, but I do want to thank Nikki, who did a lot of the work on this. Um, she spent a lot of time uh, talking to VLCT, uh, talking to um, other communities, and trying to figure out what should be included in this policy um, and what cannot be included in this policy. Um, part of what some will say later on is this is not the policy I want. It's a policy I could put together this time. Uh, similar to when I present the budget to you, there's obviously more I want in it. If we had, if I had all the time in the world to sit down and do this for a month and a half, you know, I think we have a very different policy in, in front of you. Um, but as we know, time is limited here. So this is what we could put together um, over the course of an entire year. Um, so history of it, um, this policy was created in 2020. Um, it has not been updated since. It has not been looked at. Um, I'll be honest, when I came in in February, most of this was not, was not even being followed. Um, it kind of just existed as a personnel policy. But besides some of the uh, vacation sick time, it was mostly ignored or not even talked about. Um, since this policy was created, um, all the union contracts have been updated. Um, so the first policy in the union contracts do not mesh at all, um, which creates confusion and lack of consistency. Um, a great example of this is Martin Luther King Day. All the unions have it as a holiday. The present policy does not. So either town, the Mr. Manager has to either close town hall, ask department heads to come in and work, or only have department heads come in and work, and take time off, which seems kind of insane if you have the DPW director in by himself and all the union members home on a holiday. Um, so that's kind of an example of where things aren't don't line up well. Um, again, this updated policy for your consideration um, is based on guidance and BLCT. They have kind of personal policy that you can go kind of steal. That's where we got a lot of language from, so it has been reviewed a lot by attorneys. Um, talking to other uh, municipalities around Vermont to see what they have and try to align our benefits close to theirs. Um, and also with staff, um, trying to get input from the staff to see what they wanted in the personnel policy. Uh, because again, part of this is to protect the town, uh, but also part of it is to encourage our employees to stay with us for a long period of time. So our personnel policy that kind of benefits them. Um, so again, this is about a year ago. As I said, when I came in, the policy was kind of a piece of paper that no one talked about. Um, I opened it up probably my first week or two, started laughing, put it away because it just didn't make a lot of sense um, and didn't really do what it needed to do. Um, so we spent months going over guidance and BLCT um, and talking to other municipalities. Um, once we had kind of a, a pretty good draft that we were happy with, we sent to every employee in Woodstock for them to look at, to review, and offer suggestions. Um, some of those suggestions were included in the personnel policy you have now, some were not. And I wanna stress, we'll go over some things that weren't included. 
there weren't, they weren't not included, if I can say that, um, because they were bad ideas. Some of them because we just didn't have the bandwidth. Some of them we didn't want to um, create more confusion or things we weren't really prepared to put in place yet. Um, so we kind of have those on the back burner for updates in the future. Um, the hope of this policy is to have it in place by July 1, 2024, uh, which gives us only 20 days. Um, I'm being optimistic. Um, as we know, the original goal is to have this conversation in April, uh, throughout all of April, but the short-term rental meetings kind of push us back. And then I took a vacation, so now here we are. Um, we'll talk later about kind of scheduling more meetings up until July 1. Um, but if we can make July 1 being as close as possible to the July 1, I think we it would be very beneficial as that's kind of the new fiscal year and having these things align at the same time will be very helpful. So the goal is this policy. Uh, we want to kind of present clear expectations for all employees so they know what's expected of them, they know what they're getting, they know how to act, how to behave, uh, what they can and can't do. Uh, for it to protect the municipality and the employee. So we have things in it that make sure that we're protected, uh, but also the employees are protected. So if there's an issue with an employee, they know what they can do to get it rectified, uh, but also we can protect ourselves in case we have to get rid of an employee or discipline them. Um, to retain and recruit skilled employees. Um, happy and qualified staff make better workers that provide better services to the community, and then the residents are happier if their tax dollars are going to good services. Um, if they come in and people are happy, smiling, happy to be here, they're going to do better work, and that work's going to show. People are going to appreciate it more. Um, similar to the budget, uh, a good personnel policy is going to create a, a blueprint for what we want Woodstock to be and what we want it to be in the future. So what employees do we want to retain, recruit? How we want to treat them when they get in here? Um, similar to the budget, that is another policy that really speaks to what we want Woodstock to be. So it's not only, you know, is it three personal days or two personal days, it's how we want Woodstock to look like to people who want to be here. Uh, we mentioned some of the work Nikki did. Um, so she has sent us some HR conferences, uh, preparing for certificates, uh, helped create internal policies, review old policies, um, helped us streamline some of our processes, um, reviewed, updated, and sometimes created in police files that did not exist. Uh, previous to her looking through some of them. Uh, so I do want to thank her for all the hard work on that. Um, okay, so here's uh, the section that get my staff mad at me. So here are things that we did not include um, in this current policy. Um, I did skip this from before. The goal is we have a policy now, the boards make updates to it now-ish, but then we review this each year to kind of make changes I think we want in the habit of all these documents, personnel policy, budgets, ordinances, the living documents that we can come back to and look at at any time we want. They're not like 10 commandments, we put them in stone, we hang them on the wall and we forget about them forever. We, we want these to kind of be constantly reviewed to make sure we're being up to date as possible. Uh, so one thing that we talked about was having town meeting day as a holiday. Uh, some municipalities do have this. Uh, so on town meeting day, use that Tuesday, Town hall is closed, so employees can either participate in their town meeting that day or at their one at home. Um, for me, on town meeting day, I worked from home and our auditorium in Bethel, so I attend Bethel's town meeting, uh, then I came to work. I had that benefit with some, some flex hours because I work all the time. Most employees don't have that ability. Uh, so this was discussed, um, decided not to include it in this year, but there it is. Um, another one's unlimited vacation time. So this is very popular um, and for the private sector. Um, it works two ways. One, it's one very attractive to an employee to think of unlimited vacation time, with a vacation whenever I want. The benefit of the municipality is when they leave, there's no payouts, right? They have no accrued time, so we don't have to pay them for eight months of vacation time. Uh, they walk out the door with, with nothing. Um, we did not do this. A, we have a lot of employees that have built up vacation time already. So how we transition them away from that would be very difficult. Um, second, you need very strong department heads that are willing to say no to vacation time. You need employees who are not going to take advantage of it. So an idea that got thrown out there is not included, but we talked about it. Um, comp time. 
So this would not be um, paid comp time, but what it would be is if uh, someone has a night meeting like Robert's here tonight, um, he would gain two hours of comp time that he could use within a time, a time period, let's say a month or six months to maybe leave early one day or come in late one day or take a longer lunch one day. Um, again, an idea that got talked about, um, it's a good way to kind of help ensure uh, work-life balance. So you're saying to someone, you're gonna be here late tonight, coming late tomorrow or leave early Friday so you can spend more time with your family. Um, again, not including this personal policy, but something to think about. Um, lump sum vacation. So again, the way we work is you get accrual each month on your vacation. Um, a conversation we had was could you do a lump sum? So day one, you get your three weeks vacation or your two weeks vacation. Um, we weren't sure if we could even do that in our accounting system. So we did not look <laughs> that far into it. Uh, but again, another idea. Um, this is another one, um, different accrual timelines. So vacation sick bonus. So one idea that got brought up is if you see the personnel policy now, we kind of split between one and five years, five and 10, 10 and 15, 15 and 20, 20 and 25, which is the standard way you do these things um, in most municipalities and a lot of businesses. This thing I got brought up was, could we spend time and figure out what's kind of the time when most people leave their job? Is it two years, is it three years, is it a year and a half, is it four years? And if you find that kind of that, that time, is that when you change the benefits? So instead of waiting the five years, you said, okay, people leave the job normally two and a half years into it. So at two years, we're gonna give you more, we more vacation, more sick time. Um, again, something we didn't have the time to look into, um, but again, an idea that we should consider going forward. Um, paid parental leave, uh, dependent care reimbursement. Uh, two more ideas got brought up, um, and these are two things that we just didn't have the bandwidth, really, to kind of dig into and see the cost benefit of it. Uh, whether it be useful, get all, the, or all, get all the information. So I didn't want to present something to you that I could not fully explain and tell you what that would mean for us. Um, so again, that's why it's not included. But again, things that could be very beneficial to our employees. Um, so before I move on, I just want to make clear that um, I have suggested a personnel policy for the boards. You are have free will all that personal policy. So if any of these ideas you think are a good idea or, or you want them included, you have that power as a board to include them. Um, we can get more information for you on any of them, um, but you have free will when it comes to personnel policy. Um, I may regret saying that, but it's possible. Um, so some additions to policy. Uh, we include definitions um, to kind of just let people know what we're talking about. Um, a review, um, with me and the boards on this policy yearly. Um, kind of employment practices. So when there's open position, internal transfers and promotions, hiring, personnel records, exit interview process. We've started exit, doing exit interviews. They've been very valuable to get people's insights into working in Woodstock, because as they're leaving, they're a little more willing to speak freely. Uh, so it's a great way to kind of get what they think about working for Woodstock is like. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see kind of all, all, all the stuff you have in front of you, conflict of interest, fraud, um, reasonable accommodations for nurses and mothers, uh, telecommuting, outside employment, productivity, uh, update computer system policies. So really trying to fatten up this policy and kind of cover as much ground as possible. Um, so now we get to the good parts, um, increased benefits. So these are the kind of the major changes you'll see in the personnel policy. So you sit down with the one you have in front of you in the old one, these are things we want you to focus on. Um, going from one personal day to three personal days. Um, currently, every union, except for the fire uh, union, has two personal days. Our personal policy still has one. Um, the fire is going to be renegotiating their contract this year. My assumption is they'll ask for at least two personal days. Um, the third personal day is a very, very small way to help um, combat burnouts in, in town hall uh, and throughout the municipality. Uh, personal days do not roll over. So you, if you don't use them, you lose them. The people will use them where vacation time, you get paid out when you go. Uh, so people may not be as willing to use them. So giving someone three personal days is our way of saying, we wanna make sure you take some time off for yourself. Um, 
so it's a good kind of way to kind of encourage people to take care of themselves a little bit more. Um, moving holidays, so in, in, increasing free paid holidays um, from what we currently have. So one, we talked about um, is MLK Day. That'll put us all in line with all the unions. So now the, the department heads would fall under the same policy of the union when it comes to um, that holiday. Um, next is Juneteenth, which is now a state holiday. The governor signed it, I think, two weeks ago. Um, so this will kind of put us in line with a uh, state holiday to make sure we kind of mirror the state on that. Um, the third is Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, to kind of show that, as I talked about, what do we want Woodstock to be? What do we want Woodstock to look like to tell us that people? By having this holiday, it's a way to show that we are an inclusive community that cares about other people, um, not only for our, our um, employees, but also for other communities as well. Um, some changes on vacation and crew leave time. Um, so right now, when you're hired for six months, you have no vacation time. Um, I think that that was done kind of that's your probation over, probationary period. Um, but when people see that, it kind of really freaks them out. Um, and then five days for the first year, then 10 days going on that. So the new one kind of throws in an extra day, extra week, uh, a little bit earlier. Um, and full transparency, Nikki did this, but this would benefit me. So I'm going to say that out loud, um, that I'm not trying to hide anything. This I would get an extra week of vacation on this. So just everyone's clear on that. Uh, blame Nikki, not me. Um, but again, it's another way to show employees who stay here longer that they have more time off to kind of really encourage them to stay. And one thing I should say with all this too, um, and I should have said this earlier, um, when I'm talking about all these hours, it's based on 40 hours. When we start talking about fire, the fire department and EMS, we got to make some changes because they don't work a 40 hour work. They work sometimes 24 hours a week or 48 hours a week. So there will be some adjustments for them. Um, they're aware of it and we'll hash that out when the personnel policy is all set. Um, sick leave, same 12 days. Um, after five years, you go to eight, 18 sick days. Again, that's hopefully encourage young people to get here. So when they start families, they have kids, they need more sick time. Another benefit for, to keep them around for a little bit longer. Um, bereavement right now is three days. Um, if you've lost anyone, three days is not enough time to, to go home, come back, and be ready for work. Um, I lost someone. I was back in the office within three days, and let me tell you, that month of work was not my best work, right? Because you're not really thinking positively. You're just going through the motions. Um, so this kind of allows us to have something horrible happen to you. Take the time you need. We'll make it when you come back. We'll be here for you. So again, just showing employees we care about them and we care about the situation, and they're not just robots that do at work. They're living, breathing people who have feelings and emotions. Um, so uh, in conclusion to the presentation, um, as I said, well, this is no, by no means a perfect policy, just like the budget was not a perfect budget. Uh, but what we want to happen um, is that so this is a first step, and the board's looking at this person policy, making changes, but also feeling comfortable that you can go back and make changes next year and the year after that and the year after that. So this is also kind of not just updating this policy, but training us to think that way, that once the decision is made, we can't alter it after the fact. Um, and the goal is to make reasonable changes now to improve this policy, take it from something that is not employee friendly at all, make it more employee friendly, um, and make this an attractive place to work um, with the goal that we can update this as we see fit. Um, so what, what's next? Um, we need to schedule some more joint meetings. Who doesn't love being here at night, uh, every single night? Uh, we're going to talk more about questions the board has, concerns, uh, changes you want to make. Uh, we also need to schedule department head presentations um, and also with committee and commissions to give them direction. Um, so those, those things I think we can kind of do hand in hand. Uh, we're gonna have the department heads come and speak to the boards, then after they leave, talk more about the personnel policy, then have the committee's commission come, talk more about the personnel policy, um, and hopefully have a vote after that. Um, we'll agree on a final draft, 
Once there's an agreement on the draft, we'll send it to our attorney to review to make sure everything's okay. Um, once it's been voted by the boards, it will then be voted by the unions to be attached to their contract. Um, so we'll all have the same benefits. Um, we will not be reopening any of the contracts. So we're just going to attach the one. We're not going to do any more negotiation. Um, and to the question that I know will come up, um, will this hurt a negotiation stance in those meetings? Uh, my argument is no, because it's going to be in a personnel policy. It's not going to be in the union contract. So they want to codify it in the union contract. It's something negotiates for that. Because uh, the personnel policy can change at any time. So if they don't negotiate to move it into the contract, we can come back next year and say, you know what? No personal days. Let's get rid of all of them. Like, hopefully we won't do that, but it's going to force them to still negotiate on that because if not, it won't be codified in their contract and they're going to want it codified in their contract because their contracts never get worse. Um, and it's much more difficult to change them. Um, so I don't believe we'll lose any negotiation power on that. And that's all I have. Uh, like I said before, I'm happy to kind of take um, large overall questions. Um, I think the board probably need more time to read through the 80 pages of what of the personnel policy. Um, so if there are any kind of overarching questions or comments or anything, happy to take them now. What are all the contracts up, the union contracts? I'm just trying to remember. Um, so fire and dispatch are up June 30th of 2025. Police will be up, uh, I believe, June 30th of 2027 or six. Uh, I believe the DPW and town is 2027 as well, or 2026, yeah. Justin, do you have any questions or? Uh, no. Frank, do you have anything? No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's a lot to digest. That's why we've had to narrow it down and give you time, not ask you for anything big today. Um, but I know, like Susan, already looked through it and offered some feedback on the definitions. Um, so if you have small edits that you see, Feel free to let me know if you want to have conversations with me alone about this. Just let me know. Happy to. Um, or if you have any other concerns with it, let me know. Um, and before we go tonight, we should kind of organize more meetings going forward. Okay. Next item on our agenda is the same guy uh, with a presentation. Okay. Our deputy municipal manager. Um, and I'll just update my resume before I get into the just, just to be safe. Um, so part two. So I think uh, personal policy is something that um, I think should be looked at um, and, and changed. Uh, what I also wanted to do was take some time and kind of give uh, an overview of what I've seen since I've been here, uh, my experience here to some degree, um, some changes that we have done already internally. Um, some changes I think we can make very quickly, uh, but then also some large conversations, issues we should discuss openly uh, soon uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page with what the future would suck to be. Um, so an agenda, uh, go kind of purpose of this conversation, an introduction, uh, my experience here, uh, some observations, issues, solutions, policy, staff, and finances, and then long-term issues and ask considerations. So this is my disclaimer. Um, hey, wow. I'm not here to blame anyone. Um, I'm not here to criticize any decision that got happened before me, uh, nor am I here saying things need to change immediately. Um, what I want to do is kind of give an overview of what I've seen since I've been here. Uh, again, changes we've made. Um, challenges we still see coming down the road um, and offer some suggestions for the future. Um, I'm a firm believer that nothing can change unless we talk about it. So by having this conversation, hopefully it motivates us to keep having these conversations. Um, and then again, this is another step so 
for us to understand where we want Woodstock to be um, and how can we ensure that we have a positive and successful future for Woodstock. Um, so I'm going to start with um, a, a quote I stole from a book. Um, this is a book called Unreasonable Hospitality. Uh, I found out about it by watching The Beer, which is my favorite TV show. Um, and what it is is a, a guy who ran a restaurant. Uh, he went, he came in, and he made it the most, the number one restaurant in the world. And we did by being unreasonable hospitality, which means you go out of your way to make everyone happy. Um, but a quote he has in it, I thought was very interesting. Um, and what it is, is I paraphrase it for myself, um, but I'm always going to do what I think is best for Woodstock. It may not be what's best for any individual person at any time. Um, if I do my job right, what I, or something I do is going to be the best for Woodstock, but also for that person as a whole, whether they know or not at the time. Um, if I don't do something and decide to do something else, it's not personal. It's not because I don't like you. It's not because I don't feel like a relationship. It's just that I'm balancing your ask, your request with everything I know, everything I have to decide, and then what I think is best for Woodstock. Um, that could be saying, we'll get to that um, dirty trash barrel tomorrow because my guys need to sleep because they were out plowing for 24 hours. Um, it's saying, I'll respond to that email about a bush in front of a stop sign because I'm in negotiations for a water company, right? Um, or saying, that's not a good request. We're not going to do that because that's going to hurt us. Um, my goal um, is when I leave, for us not to cry, which is sometimes difficult, um, <laughs> but to know when I get home that I did the best I could for Woodstock that day. Um, so sometimes I have to make people upset, including board members. Um, and my goal of trying to do what's best for Woodstock, you know, e each and every day. So let's play a little bit of a game. So when we think of Woodstock, Vermont, what do we think of? Magical, it's like a Hallmark movie. It's cute. It's for the gram. It's a great place to retire to. The way life should be, right? We've all heard these a thousand times from us, from residents, from tourists, and everything. Um, but when it's time to describe the actual inner workings of Woodstock, I feel very often we like to be Homer and kind of slowly fade away and not really discuss it. Um, and I'm here to tell you that it's not great internally. Um, and we can get into that, but the internal me mechanism of the municipality of Woodstock does not compare to the image of what Woodstock is to other people. There's almost two different worlds of being out there on the green, hanging out, going to the stores, um, spending a night at one of the nice hotels, and then being here and looking through the financials. Um, using our software, um, dealing with residents. Um, so it's kind of two different worlds. And I think we have to try to make those, blend, uh, blend those things and make it a better place. Um, so with that said, let's play another game. Does this sound familiar? Um, there's rising costs for government services and ed education. I think we all agree that's true. Um, stable population. We're now increasing population, uh, which increases the tax per household. The not of real capital improvements have been done uh, or really budgeted for. Um, we really need to broaden the tax base, grow the grand list to get more money in and keep taxes down for people. Uh, people from New York and even my God, Massachusetts <laughs> will find out about Woodstock. Then they'll want to either move here or visit here. And when they come, they'll either ruin Woodstock or enrich it. Um, some town plan is even. Um, which will help direct, to take the direction of the town and whatever way we want it to go um, and help also reduce the tax burden residents. Does that all sound very familiar to Woodstock today? See, nodding heads, yes. I pulled that from a 1958 study. On <laughs> so in 1958, a planning and budget committee got together and created a plan for Woodstock. And those are the things they said in 1958 that Woodstock had to look into. I'd say we're still kind of in the same boat on some of these things. So not much has changed in that time period. Things have changed, obviously, but the underlying issues that we need to face are still kind of the same. So let's get into it. Um, I've been here for 16 months. Um, I feel like in those 16 months, we've accomplished 
5% of the things we need to do, the changes we need to make, uh, to really get Woodstock to where I think it should be. Um, we'll go through some of the things we've done so far, uh, but it is a long road from here to where I think Woodstock needs to be, uh, to be what it should be. Um, just said that. Um, some of this is my own fault, I'm not perfect. Um, I had some successes, but I've also had some failures. Um, and it has been a steep learning curve for me. Coming into Vermont um, was much different than I thought it was gonna be. Um, what I encountered was much different than I thought it was gonna be. Uh, so it, it took me a long time to kind of get my feet wet. And I wish this was a joke, but a week before the flood in July, I told my wife, I was like, you know what, I think I'm kind of getting this. Like, this is, this is gonna be okay. And then the flood happened and, you know, I met with FEMA yesterday, so things are still <laughs> going along there. Um, and I, I still get to the place where I'm actually managing, not doing. I, I, I do things, I work, I have projects, I have deadlines each day. Um, and when I'm doing that, I'm in the weeds each day. I can't spend time on grants. I can't spend time managing staff, helping them get better. Um, I can't sit down and do long-term planning because I have deadlines, I have commitments. I have fires that get out every single day. Um, so that also has been a hindrance for me as well. Um, coming to Woodstock, uh, as we all know, Woodstock had a single municipal manager for over 30 years. Um, and then 2019, there's an in, uh, internal interim manager, then external interim manager, then a full-time manager. Then two years later, internal uh, interim manager again, then another external internal <laughs> manager, and then I was hired. So in five years, there were seven people that were municipal mm -hmm. manager in that time frame. Grand Chief Green was there twice, but it's still seven different people sat in that chair in a span of five years trying to manage a town. Um, so what does that mean? Why is that a big deal? It has led to numerous issues. Um, one, board members have felt the need um, or saw a need to be more involved in daily operations in the municipality because there's no real leadership. Board members said, okay, well, I have to step up because there's no one here to help. Um, although that's great, it also created confusion with staff members um, about power, responsibilities, and priorities. If I'm asking an employee to do something, a board member is asking them to do something, and the department head is asking them to do something, what are they going to do? Who are they going to listen to? Um, where, how their priority is going to shift? How, how are they going to make Susan happy, but also me happy, but also Stephen happy at the same time, right? So it kind of creates this narrative where they're in a situation where they don't know what to do, they feel powerless, and they feel no matter what they do, they're gonna let someone down. Um, no real policies or procedures in place. Uh, we talked about this kind of in the personnel policy as well. Uh, we had the personnel policy, we have uni contracts. That's it. There's no other policies we follow. Um, there is no institution knowledge. So by having that gap of seven people in five years, you don't have someone you can go to and say, hey, what, what was that thing five years that happened? What was the thing three years that happened? Or why did this happen? There's just a gap of knowledge at the, at the top level. Um, that also created no oversight or in-depth knowledge of our finances. Uh, Robert's here, probably once a day, Robert comes in and says, what's this? And I say, I don't know. And then we have to spend half an hour to try to find out what it is. There's no one we can go to to say, hey, can you talk to me about this? So it, that kind of creates a real gap of, of knowledge there. Um, another thing is departments having to operate on their own, um, not communicating with other departments um, and pushing back against the manager's office. Um, in other words, when there's no leadership there, departments learned or thought they had to defend themselves and fight for themselves. Um, it also creates a mistrust of chain of command. If they feel like they have to do things themselves. They're not going to listen to me, talk to me, or a person in my position because they think, well, the last person didn't help me and they were here for six months, they were gone. I'm still here. I know what's right. I need to do these things. Um, they operate in silos. They say, again, you know, if they can't trust that someone's going to be in this job for a long term, they're going to say, okay, I have to do what I have to do for my department and that's all I care about because I'm not going to have the support of someone three years from now. You know, if I go to the department and say, hey, listen, I know you're asking for a new employee. I can give it to you this year. You know, we really need someone else in planning and zoning, so they're going to employ you this year. If they know I'm here for five years and next year I'll come back and say, yep, it's your turn for a new employee, 
they didn't do that. If they think Eric's going to be gone in six months, they're not going to want to listen to me on that. Um, again, if no one is in charge, then everyone is in charge. If there's no leadership, then everyone thinks they're in charge and their opinions are what matter and, what, and their view of things what, is what matters. Um, then also the famous thing, um, things are always done this way and they're going to last you. <laughs> so if they, again, see seven people in a chair in five years, they're going to say, we're not going to listen to him because he'll be here for a year and all the changes he wants to make don't matter. So it's pushing back into that stadium of people saying like, hey, we're going to do this way. And in their head, they're like, yeah, but is Eric going to be here in a year? And if he's, he's probably not going to be, but I'm going to be here. So I'm not going to really buy into what he wants to do. Um, so that creates lack of efficiencies. We're not talking to each other. Lack of trust that we're all doing the same thing, working on the same team. Um, and really not a collaborative environment because, again, we're, everyone's focused on what's best for themselves instead of what's best for the municipality. Um, so what have we done to kind of fix that? So we've taken small changes so far to kind of help fix that. Uh, one thing with the boards, I want to thank all of you for it, um, is we have kind of agreed to our roles. Um, it's your, board, your job to legislate. It's my job to manage. So you create the laws, the ordinance. You create the personnel policy. You vote on it. I make sure it's followed after the fact. Um, and we're doing a very good job of kind of having that chain of command so employees know, I know, you know how things flow. It goes from board member to the chair to me down, down, to, down to employee. So we're all kind of all on the same page. So then I get information and say, um, so let's say Laura wants plan zone to do something. She comes to me and says, okay, can plan zone do X? I say, yes, but I know they're doing short-term rentals. So I say, okay, it's going to take a week and a half. So I know Steve and Stephanie are working on this, so you're going to have to wait. And then Steven doesn't feel bogged down by too many requests, and we can kind of make things be a, as efficient as possible. Um, we've created an organizational chart um, that kind of show where everyone sits and where everyone's located. That's quite small, uh, but you'll see, to make you guys happy, you're up top above everyone else. Um, it goes down to me, then the department heads, and then to the employees below there. Um, so kind of very crystallized view of how things should be. Um, policies. Do we need policies, right? We haven't had any. Um, so there's no policies for hiring, for onboarding, for check-ins of the staff, for annual reviews, for exit interviews, expectations, promotions, uh, no financial policies for accounts payable, for receivables, for payroll, for reimbursements, for procurement. Um, one of the things I saw in my first months was a reimbursement from an employee. They were at a conference. Um, they had a $45 meal and two beers, and they filed reimbursements. Now, never do any place ever reimburse all call, but we didn't have a policy. I had no leg to stand on to, to uh, deny that because we had nothing to go back to. Um, so not ideal. Um, the internal joke we have is if you ask about a policy, we don't have one, right? Because we just didn't have everything in place. So anytime someone says a policy for that, no, there's no policy. Um, so what does that mean? Um, we can't enforce the right thing to do. Uh, we provide any oversight if no one knows what's expected of them, right? If we don't have a policy in place, how can you say to someone you're doing the wrong thing when there's, we never told them what they should be doing? Uh, so it puts us at risk by allowing people to spend money the way they want to do, act the way they want to do. Um, and also, uh, Patrick's idea that we've always done it this way is correct because there's no other way we've told them to do it. Uh, yeah. Open up bad financial decisions. So think of no procurement rules, right? So we're not telling people to get three quotes. We're not telling them to go to big. We're not telling them to um, not call their friend and say, hey, John, can you come over and do this for us? We'll, we'll pay you. Right, so not having those things in place opens us up to very bad financial decisions, um, bad personal decisions. Right, if we don't have a way to hire people, talk to employees, manage them, we're going to make bad decisions and, and then not be able to manage them correctly in the moment. Um, with all some of these policies, we don't know how employees are feeling. We hire them, we put them in the job, and then we don't check in with them. And until they come to us and say, "Hey, I'm leaving," they're like, "Oh my God, what's wrong? Why are you leaving?" Right? There's nothing in place to kind of talk to employees, figure out what they're doing, um, figure out what they're feeling, and then make changes and better the situation while they're still here, while it's still salvageable, now when they're handing the two-week notice and going to another job. Um, 
Also, with policies not being in place, um, it's hard to know what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. So I've talked constantly about needing more staffing and needing more technology. I can't sit here and say, we need five more employees and these three technologies, because we don't know how that's all going to uh, work together. So get one new employee, two more technologies, that might be enough for a few years. But not having that information of how things should go um, really puts us at a, a, a disadvantage of knowing what exactly we need. Um, in short, without policies or changes that, it's like we're trying to escape a cave with a lighter, right? We're not, we're not going to be able to do it. We have this little thing. It's all dark. Um, and that's kind of how we've been operating, just kind of going through the motions, not really knowing what's going on or why it's going on, and not putting anything in place to really change things uh, for the better. So here's what we've done so far. So here's a list of things we put in place over the last 16 months. Um, hiring procedure, uh, vehicle policy, sick policy, uh, drug and alcohol policy, remote work from home policy. So this is uh, bad weather, child care issues. Uh, we have policies people can work from home one day if they need to kind of alleviate that, that pain. Um, with the policy, what happens with town hall closing? Um, believe it or not, vacation leave requests. We did not have a system in place if someone wanted to take vacation time to approve it and then put it on a calendar so we know they're actually gone that day. So we have that. Uh, a policy for communication with residents. So we now have a policy in place that dictates how quickly you have to respond to an email, how quickly you have to respond to a phone call, how you have to interact with residents on a day-to-day -day basis. So employees have an expectation of what they need to do anytime they're communicating with any, anyone from outside. Um, next interview process, um, a new annual and probation review process. So every year we're sitting down talking to people. Um, before the six months is up, we're talking to them again to say, hey, it's not working out, here's why you need to go. We're saying, great, you survived, but you can still need to work on these things. So really try and touch them as much as possible and talk to them. Uh, we put a reimbursement policy in place. Uh, we put a credit card policy in place. Um, we're still working kind of an overarching financial policy, which will be similar to the personnel policy, um, but we just don't have the bandwidth to kind of put that all together right now, but we will be working on it. Um, a payroll process, so when timesheets need to be, need to be in, in the office. Uh, we put together our agenda policy for the boards. Um, we did an employee survey. So in March, we sent out a sheet to every single employee, asked them to fill it out, uh, and they gave us feedback on what they like about working for Woodstock, uh, changes they need, the frustrations they, they, they felt here. Um, it was anonymous, so people felt the need that it could be you know, truthful as much as possible. Um, and then an expectations memo. So we put, I put together a whole memo of what's ex expected to every single employee, and how they should act. Um, so that is the expectation memo, and that came from the employee survey. So we asked the employees how they think they should have to act in Woodstock. We got their feedback. That's what we have. So every employee has that. That's what they can be judged against on a day-to-day -day basis. How uh, they follow these expectations. Um, if they're not, then there's roads for that. Uh, but really send down saying, hey, this is what we expect of you day in and day out, and this is what you're agreeing to doing by working here. Um, so trying to get the staff more involved. Um, we have bi-weekly meetings. So everyone sits around a table and we talk about what's going on. Every department talks about what they're going through, what they see coming up, challenges they have. So DPW can talk about road work they're doing. The fire chief can say, okay, can I make sure I have room to get through with my trucks? That communication. Uh, we can tell them what's happening in agenda meetings for the board so they can be prepared for that. So really just having time to sit down and talk to everyone and understand what's going on. Um, the other survey we talked about is kind of get feedback from employees. And the hope, one of the questions was, um, at this time next year, what do you hope has changed or improved upon? So do we actually just kind of hopefully see some improvements? Um, so expectations, I already talked about that, um, monthly department head meetings, so again, just the department heads together and kind of have a more in-depth conversation about their departments, what's going on with them, um, and really try and get people to work together as much as possible. Uh, we move offices to staff um, to kind of help increase efficiency. Um, so a great example of this is putting the finance team together. Uh, we realized that for accounts receivable, it was set up so our clerk was getting things in. She put it all in one account and never touch it again. And then when we went to reconcile that month, 
Robert will go in and have to find, try to find each deposit and then move it to the right accounts, which caused a lot of time, effort, made reconciliation very difficult. So Robert gave them the access to deposit the money in the right accounts immediately. So we've saved a bunch of time and effort on that. Um, and just having them in the same office together, having that conversation led to that. Um, we started using a new software called Monday uh, for project management and, and collaboration. So what we're able to do is I can go in, throw Steven a task, give him a deadline, tell him how important I think it is, um, and then add notes and, uh, and um, files onto it. So then he can work off that. And instead of me having to check in with him and say, hey, how's that coming along? We can interact without having to interact face to face. So someone like me who's always in meetings, it gives Steven the ability to kind of keep me informed what's going on without having to sit down day to day and talk about it. Um, collaboration. So this is still a work in progress. Um, you know, I think having a small staff is sometimes good, but sometimes it's also bad because we're so busy working and just trying to get through the job. We're not sitting there talking, talking about our job and having people give us feedback on it. So that's a challenge we have of trying to get people to take it slow and say, it's okay, you don't finish it. But if you talk about it to someone else, maybe we kind of get going and add more ideas. Uh, if we can do that, uh, we can increase efficiency because um, people can see how the jobs relate. I think it's that communicating better. Uh, and they also can share the work. So if someone's, if people are doing twice the work, they may not know that they don't talk to each other. But if they start talking to each other, then we kind of make changes that way. Um, ask the question, is there a better way to do this? Again, if someone's doing the job, they've always done the job, they're always going to do it the same way. If you start talking to someone else about it and they say, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Suddenly, new ideas come, we become, become more efficient. Um, so on this, I cannot take credit for any of this, but the listers and um, planning zoning got together one day, started talking about, you know, how things flow when it comes to permits and uh, occupancy. And they realized that in a gap of transition, um, there was no communication. And so they decided to pull in reports and looking to see what permits were filed um, and if they were on the grand list or not. Um, through that process, they found almost $6.5 million that they added to the grand list uh, in just the last year um, by just having those conversations. Coming in and saying, hey, I thought of this idea, and in working together, they found $6.5 million that we were not taxing previously. So that's just a one example of people working together when you give them the space and time. They actually do some of these things that are net benefits to the town. Um, so now we put a place in policies that won't happen in the future. So one, we got the money, but two, we'll ensure it never happens again. Uh, financials and finance. Let's play another game. Fourth uh, of July is coming up on July 5th. Um, does anyone in here know how much we spend on fireworks? $7,500. How much? $7,500. Anyone else? So, like, what, 20 minutes? Right? Anyone take another guess? Robert knows. Thousand. Huh? $11,000. So we spent $11,000 for the contract for the fireworks. Uh, that does not include anyone's time, effort, uh, or anything else that goes into it. Does anyone want to guess? How much money we spend on our financial software that does our accounts payable, accounts receivable, payroll, our grand list, our benefits, and our employee maintenance and our budgeting? We'll go with 10,000. Anyone else? You know, only because you had 11. So. Oh, I'm going to say 30. Okay. Is this Nimric? It is Nimric. Oh, $60,000. What? Really? How much? Hey, I want. <laughs> we spend. $5,425 on our final software. We spent $11,000 on a 20 minute fireworks show once a year. I'm just gonna pause for a second. I'll do it for free. <laughs> the fireworks or the- Yeah, which one, yeah. <laughs> the fireworks, I am out of my boundary on that. Um, so I just want that to, to sink in for a second. So the thing, the program we use the most that gives us the money, tracks the money, pays our employees, um, does the grand list that we added $6.5 million to, we pay half of what we pay for fireworks. What's the point there, though? Wait, does that program work? I will get into it, but it works, but not well. 
works pretty well. Does the fireworks work? Yes. Okay. Big bang. Um, so we're getting ourselves out of a, a hole of unknown financials. Um, part of this is the, the software. The software can only do so much. So we can't, to investigate one deposit takes two or three reports. It takes probably 30 minutes to just pull up one deposit from two years ago. So we're wasting 30 minutes on a solution that could very well be found in two minutes on, on other software. Uh, not having that financial information from before. We don't know how bad things, how good things are. We have the audits. We base that things off that. But just not knowing where money is or where money is allocated. Um, another great example of this is for the last two or three years, the town has allocated money in the operating budget for the South Woodstock wastewater plant. It was on the capital reserves. It was in the operating line. We haven't been paying the bond yet because it has come due. So each year on June 30th, that money went away into an undesignated fund balance. The money is still there, but it was never allocated to the South Woodstock plant. So we found that out. There's going to be a friend of the select board next week to do a transfer to fix that. Um, but that's just an example of three or four years of money not being allocated to the correct place. And luckily, we found that, so we're going to make that change. But these are things we're finding out almost daily um, on how things are or, or, or not. Um, to fix that, um, Robert's here, uh, so a new finance director. Uh, we're finally putting financial policies into place so we can track things, hold people accountable, make sure things go well. Um, we're going to take a new approach to the budget for FY26. Uh, we're going to try zero budgeting, uh, which is kind of a different approach. So typically we say, plan zoning, last year you spent $1,000 on office supplies, here's another $1,000 for office supplies. What we're going to say is, is a budget, create your budget, and then justify every single expense to us. Um, so it's going to give them the chance to say, okay, here are things I need and here's why I need them, and then we can decide how best that will work. Uh, but really trying to t make it so we prove every dollar is being spent in the correct way. Um, software requires all the steps to do, to do work. So um, I had software in Massachusetts, which I absolutely hated. Uh, until I moved here and used Demrick, and now you dream of that software every single day. Um, what the software software we currently have is um, eight or nine steps to get one thing done. Um, that's including eight or nine clicks. That, that's including going through the system and trying to find things, um, trying to figure out why something happened or tracking expense. Uh, if you ever want to have fun, go watch Robert with eight different pieces of paper in his hand trying to track how this transfer came in here and how it ended up over here. Because it's not as simple as clicking on it and seeing the history. You have to pull things all over the place. Um, so it just, it's not a good way to track money. It's not a good way to use it. It also takes up a lot of our time internally trying to work through it to get simple answers that take way too long. Um, so we're going to try to do some things to fix that. Uh, we're going to start using a, a payroll software uh, that's going to streamline our payroll. It's going to take it from taking a day to probably about two hours. Uh, it's going to be all automated. It's going to give um, employees the ability to see all their information online so they don't have to ask us for their cruel time. They'll be able to see it right there. If there are mistakes, they'll be able to see them in live time so we can fix them immediately. Uh, so we're going to use that. Um, I will come back at some point and ask for new software, uh, whether it's AP software to attach the network or something else. That's going to be a future ask of mine. Um, so from that, so what do we need in the short term um, from the boards in the community? Um, one, go slow and get it right. That's internally and externally. So taking the time to do things the correct way and going slow with them and making sure they're right rather than kind of pushing things through just because we want to get something done. Um, good example of this, despite what's happening tomorrow, is the Gore Green Ordinance on the trustees. They spent about six months talking about it from about September to when they voted on it. Um, multiple meetings, multiple conversations, bringing people in, getting feedback. So when it came time for a vote, 
It was unanimous 5 nothing because they had done it slowly and rightly the whole way. So kind of following that policy, that, that, um, that way. Make more policies and stick to the policies. It's going to be harder for us. We've already had these conversations of like, oh, can you add this to the agenda or oh, can we do this? And it's hard at first. The more we stick to these policies, the more people are going to understand that the policies aren't going to change and they're going to start following it. And it's going to be easier for everyone. Uh, next thing is what the board's going to do, goal setting. Um, and then follow through on those goals. Um, so these goals should be specific, actionable, and achievable, meaning we're not going to say, yes, we're going to do more planning, right? It's like, no, we're going to um, actively try to add three new houses in two years. And we're going to do that by doing these things. Um, we're going to say, we're, gonna, we're not going to say we're going to fix the finances. We're going to say, no, we're going to um, increase funding so we can buy more software. So make the goals actionable so we actually do them, follow them. Um, and then where the goals are, um, provide the necessary information or funding to make those goals happen. We can't say we want to do something and then not allocate any time or money to that. So kind of really sticking to what we want to do. Um, having an overarching plan for each year, but also for a long-term five-year plan. And that should fit into our budgets but also our agendas, our votes, um, and then non-meeting activity um, should kind of reflect that. So if we're saying um, we want to acquire the, the aqueduct, right? So what we're doing in meetings, outside of meetings, should be everything stepping towards that goal, um, not getting distracted by shiny keys or something else. Try to make our meetings more effective and more efficient. Um, so we read the booklet ahead of time so we have a knowledge of what's happening. Uh, we ask questions ahead of time, if possible, to kind of avoid some of the logistic questions that happen in the meetings to speed things along. Um, if there's an ordinance involved, everyone, myself included, should be reading the ordinance ahead of time, have the ordinance present with us in the meeting, so we revert back to it. Um, and then using agendas to actually help run the meetings, so have time limits on it, um, have directions, say, this vote um will impact ordinance 5552 552 can be found here it's, it's back here so the boards have all the information you need ahead of time and are prepared i have all the information I need, i'm prepared um and then we can kind of go through the agenda to kind of make sure we hit all the marks and spend our time where it should be um i've got a lot of complaints from people who have attended meetings and had to wait two three hours to speak and they get frustrated and say, i'm not coming back like why am i doing this um, I just want to, you know, ride my bike through the green or something. I had to spend three hours sitting through a meeting about whatever. So trying to make sure the meetings are effective, but also show the residents that we're doing the work, right? That we're, we value the time and their effort, and we're taking what we can do to do a good job for them. Um, ways to keep current employees and attract new ones. So the personal policy is one of these things, showing our employees that we want them to stay, we want to give them benefits to keep them, um, but also recruit new ones. It is very, very, very challenging to get employees here these days. Um, in my 16 months, I probably hired for somewhere between five and eight positions. Um, you're lucky if you get five applicants uh, for a department head job. Um, you're lucky if two of them show up to the interview, um, and you're lucky if one of them is qualified. Um, and that is across the board, um, not just here, but other names I talk about. It's very, very difficult to get employees. The one benefit we've had since I've been here is our um, health insurance. We've had three employees join us solely based on the health insurance, knowing that either had a family and they needed it, or because the health insurance is so good, it offsets the uh, decrease in salary they were taking. Um, but for someone who moved here in the last two years, um, it's challenging to move here. The cost of living is higher than it is in Boston. When I go to Boston, I feel like I'm at the dollar store, you know, like because things are cheaper than they are in Woodstock sometimes. Um, buying a house here is difficult, but getting an apartment here is difficult. So you're telling someone, hey, come work for $60,000, but we can't guarantee you a house, can't guarantee your apartment. Uh, nothing's open till Wednesday night. Um, you know, you may have to drive 45 minutes to this job. That's not a very attractive way to recruit people. So the people we have, we have to find ways to keep them. 
and find creative ways to get new people in there. Um, more staff, I talk about this all the time. Um, we have a new staff member that's out since July 1, so thank, thank you to the board for approving that and the residents for approving that, I'm, I'm very thankful. Um, but every situation is a zero sum game, which means every decision we have with staff means if they're doing one thing, they're not doing something else. So it's not a matter of most people having the free time to do it. It's here are three things, you have an hour, which one are you gonna do? And which two can we kick till tomorrow or the next day? Um, and by when you get to that thing, five more things will fall on your table. So it's really a situation where we're constantly up against it, trying to figure out what to do. Um, we just don't have the staffing to really do the things we need to do internally. Uh, more technology investments. Um, by having technology that can do some of the work for us, we may not need as much staff, right? But regardless, we can be more effective and more efficient if we have things online. We have permanent software. People can do their permits online. They'll flow through us online. We can cut down on people coming in, which gives us more time. It's going to put checks and balances through the permitting process. Um, we found out recently that um, I think on sewer permits, um, we were not checking if they actually paid. They were coming and giving the permit because they paid someone else. So there was no conversation because we weren't talking to each other. Um, so finding ways to kind of invest in technology is another way to cut down on expenses, maybe not have as much more staffing, but also make people's jobs a little bit easier so they can focus on other things. Um, and then community-wide, um, there is an expectation by a lot of people in the community for a level of service that is not equivalent to the staffing that we currently have. Um, I talked to the DPW guys the other day. To, for them to do their plow routes, um, so we have about six people plowing, they're all in your route, and then go back and sand on a stone for one pass takes five to seven hours. That's one pass, and we know when we get snow, it doesn't come once and falls. Um, so expecting them to be on someone's street immediately is not always feasible. Um, someone having a small pothole in the dirt road and not being fixed within an hour is, we get phone calls on that. We have people coming in. You know, uh, more than once I've gotten a missed phone call, then an email, and the person's in my office within an hour of that first missed call. Asking why I haven't got back to them yet. Um, so this kind of expectation versus what we can actually provide um, is something that we really need for people to understand that we can't be at the beck and call every two seconds. We're going to get to your issue. We're going to fix it. We're going to solve it. But it may take more time than you think it uh, should be. Um, and then again, that these extra requests or anything coming to us stops us from doing something else we're doing. So the more things that fall on a plate, the less time we have to focus on those things and other things. Um, so I'll pause here for a second. So those are the things I think in the short term we can kind of fix. We'll fix some of them as we talked about. We're making progress on, on, on a lot of them, um, but there's still, I think, work we can do together in the community to kind of help uh, bridge that gap. And this is where I get in trouble. So, some long term issues and, and challenges I, I, I see for Woodstock. Um, one um, is I think there's a tendency um, to focus on small concerns rather than the larger, harder, harder topics. Um, being passive about big issues, but being active about small issues. You know, I get people more excited about overflowing trash can than I do about a wastewater plant. Uh, more people excited about um, some dirt on the road than they are about uh, potentially buying a water company. Or the energy goes there instead of over here. So trying to recalibrate that and say, OK, is this a priority? Where is this following what we need to do? Um, and how is this the best use of our time? Um, put it another way, not every issue should be treated the same. So when you present with things, try to mentally go through. And this is not just the board, it's the community. This is all of us internally as well. Employees are not immune to this. It's much easier to do the small thing in front of you because you get something done. Uh, but the hard, big thing is what we really need to focus on so we can achieve things with Woodstock. Um, being advocates for the town um, to residents. So when a resident 
comes to us and says something, instead of saying, yes, I'll call Eric, yes, I'll call Steven, yes, I'll call Robert, being like, okay, I hear you, I understand you, I will talk to them, but wait, just let you know, this may not be a priority for them right away. It may take a few days. We'll tell the right people, but let them know that be the first line of defense so we can, and I'm the same way, so I can say to them, yes, I understand, I know Steven, he's really busy, it's gonna take you three days to get back to you. Like that's a timeline and we'll fill that timeline, but helping us be that first line of fence could be very helpful. Um, we'll be doing this soon is for the board to direct the committees and commissions we have um, and then hold them accountable with their goals. We have a lot of volunteers who dedicate their time. They're very smart, they're very active, they wanna help. They are just floating out in space without any real guidance on what to do. Um, and that is a, um, a benefit we should tap into much more and say, hey, we want you to go do these three things and report back to us in two months. We want you to spend your time doing this um, and really use these boards as something helpful for the town, not just something that as a meeting we have to go staff and be burdened by or complain about, but actually how can we use them to the best of their abilities. Uh, so once we have a schedule of meetings, we'll invite the chair of every committee commission that exists in Woodstock. Um, I'm sure I'll forget about a few of them, but so people will remind me, have them come. They're going to discuss what they do, what they want to do. Then it'll be on the board to say to them, great, here's what we want to do this year. Here's what we want to do next year. And then hold them accountable each year and make sure they're doing those things and doing the work we want them to do. Um, planning. Um, so planning in the terms of Woodstock's future has not really been done in Woodstock. Um, this has helped create um, the housing issue we have. It's not ours the only reason, um, but we have not invested in any kind of form of smart development. So as the house crisis gets worse and worse and worse, and we're not doing anything, we're even further, further behind than where we should be. Um, so a question the boards, I'm gonna have one you have you guys answer in the next few months. Um, is what do we want Woodstock to be um, and how we want that to be? So are we okay with Woodstock being a place for mostly tourists, second homeowners? Um, and if that's the case, that's totally fine, but we may not need a lot of planning because we can say, okay, we'll just do some zoning and have you know people buy the second, third homes in Woodstock and that's all we want, we're happy with that. Um, if that's not the case, then we need to have a conversation about what to do here to help do some development, help get young families in here, um, and planning is necessary in that. Also necessary, uh, if, we're if we're gonna do that, is to understand that there may be front, a cost up front that we'll have to pay, knowing we'll get a benefit to down the road. So an example of hypothetically um, developing a place where we get eight houses, right? We'll have to put money up front to do that work, but in the long term, we'll grow the grand list, we'll get tax property, and we'll make more money back in the long run, but there may be opportunities where we have to put some money up front first. Uh, what benefits the planning? Um, helps uh, us align our municipal resources. Um, so by planning to acquire the water company, we can now use that to um, help increase the water flow, have more housing, um, but also just we open a road and the sewer pipe's bad, the water pipe's bad, we fix it both at once because we own both of them. Um, we can uh, uh, allocate our budgets and our time kind of to that planning. So if we know what we're going after, we can say, okay, we need to fund this, we need to spend time on this. Without planning and the planning zoning, but also the planning in general, um, we kind of, again, we're kind of lost on what we should be doing. Um, it helps us increase the grand list, right? If we're doing smart development, we're getting new houses in here, they're paying property taxes, which means more income comes into the municipality, um, and we don't have to raise taxes on other people because the new people are paying those, that cost. Um, helps the capital plans. If we know where we wanna be in five years, we can make a solid capital plan to kind of follow that up, right? So if we don't know where we're going, we're kind of doing capital plans willy-nilly, throwing money here and there. But if we actually have an idea of what we want to do, that will help. Um, 
creates a blueprint for the future. Again, if we have some plans, we know where we want to be, um, that's going to create a, a, a path for us to follow uh, to make sure we get the things done that we want to do. Um, allows us to be smarter and make more impactful decisions. Again, having a plan in place, we know what we're going to do, we allocate funds, we allocate our time, uh, we're doing things more efficient that way. So, with all that said, and those questions lingering in the air, um, slight detour into planning and zoning. Uh, we currently have two staff members there. They, and they staff six committees right now. Um, in conversation with them, you're probably talking about 20 hours a week goes to these committees. That's agendas, that's booklets, that's minutes, that's prepping for the meetings, that's work after the meetings, that's writing a decision, that's all that stuff. So if we want to do planning in the future and real planning, uh, we have to have a conversation of what we want that office to look like. Um, so we can reorg some of the committees. Uh, there's some committees that are advisory. Can we make them be less involved? Uh, can we have them staff themselves so we're not spending time and money doing minutes for them and their and general booklets? Um, could we condense them so we don't have as many committees to give more time to staff? Um, that's a way to kind of give time back without adding more staff is you kind of give them more time. Um, permit software is the third time I said it. I'm going to keep on saying it. Uh, it's a benefit not only to plan and zoning, my office, but also police and fire who gives permits. It's a way to kind of streamline a lot of things. Um, and the question comes down to, again, that I'll ask the board to answer in the coming months, is, this a, is economic development a priority for the boards? Um, is new housing a goal of the boards? If it is, then we have to take steps to get there. Um, if it's not, then we have to have a different conversation of what Woodstock's going to be if we're going to kind of keep the status quo and rely on the current population to pay increased taxes um, as costs continue to rise. So we kind of have to answer this question and then decide, once we answer that question, where we want to go. Um, and then long term, what's the next 10, 20 years of Woodstock? What does it look like? What do we want it to be? Um, Again, that will allow us to kind of shape how we want this place to be. If it's the board's decisions that we don't want development, um, and we want to keep things the way they are, then great, we can plan out how we have to spend money the next 20 years. Um, but these conversations kind of need to happen. Uh, local businesses. Um, so a great thing about Woodstock is we have the village, small, cute stores, um, very, engage active business owners. Uh, we have two of them on the board. Um, we have another business owner as well, but not in the village, but still there. Um, I've had numerous conversations with business owners. Um, some business owners who are in Woodstock now, some who have left, uh, some who refuse to come into Woodstock. Um, and what they say to me is they get the feeling that they're not welcomed in Woodstock. Um, that the zoning laws prohibit them from being what they want to do, that the government here is, quote, unquote, making things more difficult for them. Um, that is what I'm hearing from a lot of people. Um, when I moved here, I was in a different town talking to a business owner, told them, I was so excited, I'm, oh, I'm a new manager of Woodstock, and he went on a 30-minute tirade about why he would never do business in Woodstock. Uh, he owns two very successful businesses, and another town that would fit perfectly in Woodstock, he, I don't think will ever come here. Uh, I talked to another business owner who had left uh, Woodstock recently. Not knowing this, I just said, oh yeah, I'm the town manager of Woodstock. And 20 minutes later, he's still yelling at me about things that happened 10 years ago. And I was like, my fault. Um, so there's that sense in the community. Um, on top of that, they have high rents and absolute landlords. They don't have landlords who live in the community who have a general, um, engagement and them being successful. Housing for employees. Um, talk to any business owner. The first thing they'll say is housing, housing, housing. Um, I saw a business owner two weeks ago. I was dropping my dog off at puppy camp. I said, hey, how you doing? He said, hey, how you doing? He's like, yep, need more housing for employees. And I was like, it's 730. Can I just drop my dog off and, you know, get, get to work? Um, but, you know, that's what he's thinking at 730 in the morning on a Thursday. You know, the moment he sees me, housing, housing, housing. 
Um, the tourist first residence issue, you know, they had to cater tourists because that's where the money comes from, but not also shun residents who are here year round. Um, then the lack of tourists. So what do they do when it's mud season or stick season, uh, when people aren't around, how are they gonna make it their business so they can be here year round? Uh, and also have full-time employees year round too. So I think we need to consider the importance tourism has on the community, the role it plays in Woodstock um, and why people do come here. Um, we have to work with and listen to the business owners. So what do they need? Uh, what do they want? Uh, are they employee housing, uh, maybe parking, uh, but what else do they really need? How can we help them? We know they need employee housing, we know they need parking solutions, but what can we actually do to help them? I don't think we have a solution. If we did, we'd add it, but like, we need to think about these things. There are way too many empty storefronts in Woodstock for what Woodstock is, um, and we need to find a way to fix that. Um, oh, there it is. I already said that. Um, and then making uh, owning a business was Woodstock attractive. We want people to want to be here. We want people clamoring to get into these storefronts and open businesses, and we want them to be successful and get here. We don't want them being that's eh, too much work, I'm gonna go down the road or I'm gonna go somewhere else. We want them to be here having successful businesses. We want to make someone go from the inn all the way down to East End Park and have a great time going to uh, different shops and stores and really exploring what's stuck. Um, so, um, and just on that, um, I'm gonna be working with planning and zoning. Uh, we're going to be creating or hosting a um, business owner form somewhere in the next month where I'm gonna invite all businesses um, to the town hall round table, just let them talk to me about what they want, what they need, their issues, their concerns in a format where hopefully they'll feel comfortable speaking up to me. And because it's me, I can't legislate anything. So there won't be any ask, they can just kind of speak freely to me. And I'm hoping that's kind of first step to figure out where we, where we can go. Next, um, the village. So, at the risk of making more people upset, um, the village budget is about $1.5 million for this year, starting on July 1. About $700,000 of that is property tax. Um, the rest, about eight fifty, dollars is from local revenue. Um, of that eight fifty, dollars 459000 or 30% of all revenue that the village receives comes from the town for the police contract where um, the village supplies police coverage for the for the entire town. Um, I want you to picture in your head for a second a scenario where the town decides not to contract with the village for police services. What happens then? Thirty percent of the village revenue is gone in a second. That's four hundred fifty thousand dollars gone. Talking to Chief Swanson, he assumed that would be two to three officers gone. And then cut a service from 24 7 service to something like Monday through Friday, 7 to 7. Um, so a massive chunk of the village's revenue hinges on the town and the contract we have in place. Um, I'm not saying the town is going to do anything and that I would advocate that they do, but that is a risk for the village of so much of your budget hinges on this one thing that could be taken away um, relatively easily and, and quickly. Um, on that, we can focus on the police. Um, we just passed a new police contract that was signed last year by trustees, a three-year contract. Um, the last year of the contract, FY26, we purposely put in a, an extra bump to kind of get the police salaries closer to surrounding communities to kind of keep that retention and recruitment going. Um, and that was purposeful. We had a list of what other, um, towns and cities make, and so we kind of try to compare to that. With no other changes to the village budget, so not including my salary that's allocated there or plan and zone or anything else, um, that salary increase is gonna be about an 8.5% increase for taxes for the village in that budget year. So if no revenue comes in, no new revenue, nothing else, we're looking at an 8.5% increase for the village just based on that. Higher when you consider rising cost of goods and services, but also my office salary is split, was it Robert? 25, 25. 25% of my salary, 25% planning and zoning, 25% of uh, finance, 
um, is also in the village budget as well. So we're looking at a massive increase on the village side just for that. Why bring that up? Because even with that increase we gave the police department to catch them up, we're already behind again. Um, Bedford is already $2 more an hour than we are. Um, Windsor is about $7, seven uh, more an hour than we are. Um, other communities are much higher. The moment we signed, other people signed even higher. They have retention bonuses, they have sign-in bonuses, they're paying more per hour. Uh, so even taking on this financial um, task of trying to get them to uh, the place close, we're still not close again because what's happening out there is police salaries are going through the roof. It's so hard to get people. So this is not obviously ideal uh, for the village budgets. Um, on top of that, uh, we had the audit today. Um, the village unfunded fund balance is under eight thousand dollars. What the undesigned fund balance is is basically money that is not assigned to anything that sits in your account and can be used for emergencies or if you're over budget or if you're in a deficit, it's there to kind of provide some protection. What it means is uh, over the course of X amount of years, we've had more revenue than we had expenses. Last year, and fund, un undesignated fund balance was zero. The year before that, it was in deficit. So this is better than we were, but it's not great. I think this year the village will probably add maybe eight, ten thousand more dollars to this account hopefully. <laughs> Um, that's all we have the village as a safety net. Um, so there is no, if there is an emergency cost on the village side, there's no money there to really help it unless we dip into capital reserves to protect that. The undesignated fund balance for the town is $1.7 million. So that's, the town has a safety net. They have they have cautions. If we if we need to buy something, I know there's money there if we need if we need to. When it comes to the village, there just isn't any wiggle room. Um, and I'm running low on battery. Almost done. Um, so that already. Um, and then the village budget, because it relies on a small tax base, the appetite for large increases is not there because they're also being taxed by the town. So the village is paying taxes, two different sets of taxes. So the appetite for a large increase to kind of get us to a safe place may not be feasible. Um, so it comes to my question is, how financially sure can the village be in the future? I don't know that answer yet, but these mm -hmm. things that go over it gives me concern about where we can be in the future. If we don't have more development in the village to increase the grand list, um, or if we don't find revenue sources to help increase or match the normal services that are going up. Um, we're giving employees 3% COLAs, inflation 78%, right? So we're not really even matching what's out there. Um, so this is uh, the second last slide. Uh, so one, this is again, these are the bigger questions that I think we need to ask and look into. Um, what are ways that we can increase revenue without passing all that cost on to businesses and residents who have already bear the brunt of a lot of this in the past? So we have to find new ways to get more revenue in the town and in, in the village. Is that increasing the grand list? Is it finding clever ways to raise more money? We have to figure that out. Second, I think we should investigate what it will look like if we move the police department under the town government. That's what we did with DPW a while back. Is that a financial benefit to everyone? Is it not? We should look into it, we should investigate. We have to ask these questions so we know what the answers are before we do anything. Going through what we just looked like, this could be a way to share the cost over to the town um, and then have a larger tax break, a larger tax base cover that cost. But something we should look into. Finally, um, the M word. Um, merger. Um, I've been here for 16 months. Uh, this has been talked about since I've been here. Um, the last time a report was done was, I believe, 2005. Um, and Jill Davies sent it to me today, so I appreciate it. Um, but we should look into is this a good idea? Is it a bad idea? And not just 
the things we always say uh, to the last five, 10, or whatever the, the, or whatever the case may be, but actually spend time to look into the cost benefit of this versus what we will lose. So would it help? Yes or no? Um, is it feasible? Can we actually do this? Is it a way to, to merge the two communities in a way that makes sense? Um, if so, how will we do it? What's the timeline? What would it take to do it? What's the cost associated with it? Um, what would what's that look like after? So if a merger happened, what is Woodstock then? What are the boards like? What are the, the residents like? How's everything set up? Um, and then is there a way if the merger happened for the village to remain protected or is some way the same? Can, can there be a zoning law to protect that district um, or not? Things to look into. Um, someone could probably answer that question now. Um, so I want to be clear in the email I sent to you, I'm not saying, I'm saying we do a merger tomorrow. I'm not saying we move the police department to the town tomorrow. I'm not saying we do any of them right now. I think these are large questions that are going to dictate the future of Woodstock. And I think we have to at least talk about them and investigate them. And so we can make the best decision for Woodstock, whatever that is. And that's a job that I think the board should look into and, and discuss. Um, and I'm happy to help in any way I can. Um, so in conclusion, um, there's a reason why everyone here lives in Woodstock. There's a reason why I moved up here and took this job. We love Woodstock. We want to see it succeed. We want to see it thriving. We want it to be happy. We want people who have kids to have the kids here and have the, raise the kids. And we want people to come and visit. Um, I love nothing more than having friends and family come up and say, let's go to Woodstock for the day. You know, and I can't believe you work here. Uh, so we want that to happen. But there are challenges ahead. And we have to be willing to have the tough and uncomfortable conversations so we make the right decision for Woodstock. And I think if we do that, um, we can make the municipality of Woodstock as great as the image of Woodstock is as itself, right? So we do the right things, we work smartly, we make smart decisions, we ask the right questions, we have the uncomfortable conversations like I'm doing right now, um, then we can make the right decision for Woodstock going forward. And almost on cue, I lost my power. Um, so the net last page was um, comments, questions, with me looking very nervous in the picture. Um, so I wanted to give this presentation. Um, oh, thank you, Stephen. Um, because I've been here long enough to, to see what's going on. Um, and I do think we need to at least decide on a lot of these tough questions because it's going to dictate the next two or three years of Woodstock. Um, and so with that said, uh, I'm happy to work with the boards on all these. I'm happy to take questions, comments, um, or I'm happy for us to schedule department head meetings and go home and get a good night's sleep. That was a great six minute presentation there. <laughs> I was saying you have to be short and, and quick. I went on for very long. But the great part, I was serious about the great part. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, I think there are a lot of things that people talk about amongst ourselves, and it's to have somebody say it out loud on a PowerPoint presentation is helpful. And it's the, you know, the first first thing is admitting you have a problem, right? That's the first step. <laughs> uh, I think talking about it. Yeah. You know, I think talking about, like, we don't have to say, let's do a merger tomorrow, but I think going through the cost benefit of it actually investigating it, talking about it, um, talking about all these things, talking about what we want Woodstock to be. You know, there are people who say uh, we need 500 houses five years ago, right? Um, do we want that? Does, does the town want to work towards that? If, if, if so, we have to stop talking about it and start putting things in place to do it. If we don't want to do that, then we have to come to the realization that we're looking at a tax bracket that's small, that's not growing, knowing that costs continue to go up. So how do we want to manage that going forward? That's a very difficult, that's another difficult conversation. You know, it's just as difficult as telling someone to put an apartment building behind their house is saying like, okay, we may be in trouble. What can we do to solve this issue? Um, so I think it, it's, it will behoove all of us to kind of start doing that. Um, what do you see? I know this is kind of a broad question, yeah. but 
What do you see as the first three things we should? Um, good question. Um, one, I think the first thing we should do is have the board set goals. Have the board set goals, and I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell the boards what, what goals you should set. That should be up to you. I'm happy to give advice and everything else. Um, but I asked, I had the question in the PowerPoint. Is I think one of the major questions is, do we want development? And if we want development, what development do we want? And where where do we want that to go? Because if the answer is yes, then we start working towards there. We're already behind. It's going to take five, six, seven years to get anything done. Um, and so we're already way behind the ball on that. Um, if we don't want that, then what do we want with stock to be? I think that's the first question that's going to dictate kind of where we go from there. Um, I think the second um, thing we should do um, is, I think, keep talking about this. You know, I think we have a tendency to have this conversation and then move on from it and not revisit it for six, seven months. Um, I think these should be. As we set our goals for the boards, these are things we should be talking about. When you have the committee's commissions come in front of you, these are questions you should ask them. If you, when you have the EDC, when you have the finance committee, when you have the planning commission, right? Ask their opinion, get their feedback, ask them these questions. Um, let them tell you what they think. Well, let them see how, how they can help um, or what they've seen. You know, there might be a committee that has looked into this for a while and they have that expertise to kind of give to us. Um, I think the third thing is um, oh, the third thing I think for the select board is I'm going to come uh, sometime soon with a request to use some money from the undesign undesigned fund balance. The underwear. The undesigned fund balance okay. um, to purchase some more technology um, and a few other things. So that would be my third request. I think that's something we can do quickly and get that in in, in the system and see how that benefits us because that's. The more technology we have, and we're not asking for you know AI or anything, but we can then figure out what we're, we're still lacking. You know, is a permanent software, as a case, you know, gonna solve a staffing issue? I don't know, but we're never gonna know until we try. Permanent software is cheaper; you can get rid of it quicker, um, and it's just a great way to say, okay, we have this now, and now you know what? We may only need one more staff member, or now that we have this, we're realizing that. These three people have 20 more hours a week on their hands, and now they can go do other things. Um, so those would be my thing. Thank you. Frank, did you have anything? No, thanks. Harry, anyone? Support that? This was a great presentation. I was just going to say this was so comprehensive and pretty excoriating, frankly. Um, but I'm so glad you're at the helm, and I'm like eager to really. To help us all move forward. Yeah, yeah. Else? Let's schedule some more meetings, guys. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the select board has a meeting next Tuesday at six. Um, I don't know if there's enough time for the department heads to get a presentation together, but I can ask them. Um, I was thinking like 10 minutes per department like a five to ceremony presentation on their own and then a few minutes for questions uh so we're talking about police fire uh planning zoning uh right now there's no director of public works um so we're probably talking about five or six departments uh, to come in front of the board so we probably do it in an hour um if that's a possibility um i'm also not against doing during the day so the department heads don't have to stay late that's a possibility as well um, but I think the select board meeting would be the first opportunity. Um, but we also look at other options as well. Next one, more discussion on personnel. Yeah, so the, the next one would be department heads coming in front of us with uh, what they want their goals to be for the next year. Um, so I, I think if we give hour for five to six departments, that should be enough. So if we did a meeting at five to six, if that's possible. If not, we can look at meetings next week or when we don't have a meeting schedule and do an, uh, a separate meeting. I think the five o'clock on the 18th yeah. is good. Yeah. Justine, five o'clock. Five o'clock on the 18th. I won't be. Are you out next week? Oh, yeah, I'll be gone next week. What? 
I can do Zoom. It, will there be something so that Jeffrey can get caught up? Yeah, I mean, there'll be uh, huh? yeah. recorded, but also would it be the department heads giving like a five minute presentation of what their department does, what they want to do in the next year um, with the budget they currently have, obviously not going to change, and the board's asking a few questions. Um, so they'll have that in writing. I'll let them do, like, I mean, David Green will probably just come up and speak. I assume she saw some will as well. Stephen will probably have a PowerPoint. Um, Robert, I'm not sure. Um, what are they comfortable with? You know? Um, yeah. What if we had a format that the questions were asked to every every group in questions? There can be, you know, but I mean, some of it's like, I think when we talk about, say, plan and zoning, I'm probably going to have uh, ideas to want to do more planning and potentially more more zoning, where the fire department EMS is probably going to be fun saving lives. You know, like it's to say, like the goal, the goal there are different. You know, they may have more capital project um, conversations. You know, I know um, they're talking about getting new fire trucks. That's probably his big thing of how we can how we can do that. Um, so it may be a little different depending on the departments. You know, and someone like Robert's only been here for seven or eight months. Well, no, I have as much of an in-depth knowledge as Steve has been here for over two years. So it'll be a little fluid, I guess. Well, I think the 18th. Frank, does the 18th and the 5 make sense for you? Or are you available? Yeah, that works. I'll be on Zoom. Be on Zoom. Yeah. Brenda, Gary. yes. I'll be here. Okay. And Jeffrey, you're out. I can check up. And... Okay. Yeah, I can. And I'm always happy to follow up with you. Gary. Sorry, I had to get to back to my computer. That works. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then potentially the 25th for another joint meeting. Now be the committees and commissions front of the boards. That's uh, the next the next Tuesday. Five o'clock. Okay. Uh, whatever. Let me just make sure there's no uh, other meetings. I'm trying to think how many committees we have though. Maybe that's it. Yeah, that's one of the problems. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we do five to six thirty. Um, that's the twenty fifth. Yes. So I can let I can let the chairs of those boards know. So that'll give them two weeks. Um Department heads should be okay with a week. And that's five to six thirty. Yes. Frank, second with you. Yeah, it looks good for me too. The twenty fifth, correct? Yes. Yeah. It's fine mm -hmm. for me. Huh? Yeah, too. Huh? The only thing I'll say is, you know, keep looking at personnel policy. Uh, we're, we're short on time, so the more we look at individually um, and get feedback, so when we meet, we can kind of. When are we talking about personnel policy? As much as we can. Oh, when? Um, when? So the site board is going to talk about it in their meeting next week. Okay. Uh, if we have time after the department heads, we'll talk about it quickly. But we may have to schedule another meeting for that as well. Okay. So. And you don't want to schedule that today. That yeah, let's see how quickly we need it on yeah, to go. It may not go as quickly. Any other business to come before the trustees? Okay, in that case, I would make a motion for the trustees to adjourn it. Say aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries.
Move we adjourn. Any additions?